Chapter 1. My helmet had melted, and my oxygen tank was empty, but I ran right back into that burning building, and I carried those kids out one by one. Then I went back in for the cat. Dee Dee Bannon sat in the nicest restaurant in Rapid City, across the candlelit table from the worst date of her life. This was the fourth heroic firefighter story he had told. The first one, she'd swallowed, hook, line, and sinker. She was a kind, trusting soul after all. But then the second tale had sparked her skepticism. What were the chances one fireman would have the opportunity to rescue a 102-year-old woman from the roof of a bowling alley and save a baby from a burning horse barn in the same day? And he didn't look strong enough to carry an old lady or a baby. So after the second tall tale, Dee Dee excused herself from the table, went to the restroom, and plugged the guy's name into an internet search. Despite his being a lieutenant and having completed so many heroic feats, there was no mention of his name attached to firefighting on the entire World Wide Web. The only Neil Clinton she could find was a high school football star in Nebraska. She'd been subjected to two more ridiculous stories since she returned to the table, both delivered while he stared directly at her chest. Their food hadn't been delivered yet, but he was working hard on the cocktails. Have a drink, Deirdre, he said for the third time. No, thank you. Water is fine. Come on, Deirdre, he'd been putting extra emphasis on her name since she told him that people called her Dee Dee, live a little. Dee Dee needed to escape, but getting up and walking out would be so rude. She considered her options. Don't be scared. He winked at her. She shuddered. Okay, she had to get up and leave. She could do this. No big deal. And yet she sat, wondering if there was such a thing as being too nice of a person. If so, then that was her, and she couldn't make herself get up and leave. Fine. She would suffer through it. And then change her phone number. Resolved to this plan, she tried to think about something pleasant as he prattled on, but when the server brought their food, and Neil made a salacious comment about her bosom, that gave her the excuse she needed to pull the plug. She smiled up at the server. Actually, could I get that to go? The server, who had heard Neil's comment, dropped Neil's plate in front of him with such a lack of grace that it clattered on the table. Then, without a word, he turned away, presumably to box hers up. What? Neil was confused. What do you mean? You're leaving? Yes, I'm leaving. That last comment was demeaning and insulting, and I'm uncomfortable. She stood and dropped her napkin on the table. And there's no such thing as five-degree burns. His eyes darkened, and he slowly stood. She knew he was trying to intimidate her, but it wasn't going to work. She might be a woman, and she might be rich, but she'd grown up on a cattle ranch. She didn't scare easily. She turned away from him, looking for any sign of her server or her meal, wishing she had just left without asking for the box. She'd taken about four steps when Neil grabbed her arm from behind. His tight grip hurt, and he spun her around so fast that she rolled an ankle. You're not leaving, he hissed. She didn't think. She just swung. Her open palm connected with his cheek, and the shock on his face would have been satisfying if she hadn't been so shaken. He stood frozen, glowering at her, and a man in a cowboy hat came out of nowhere to step between them. This man was drop-dead gorgeous, but she tried not to notice. He looked vaguely familiar too, but this was South Dakota. Even in the city, she'd probably seen him around somewhere. You need to go, the cowboy said evenly. Even now looking at the back of him, she could tell how ruggedly he was built. Neil was no match for this hunk. She sneaked a peek at the table he'd come from, hoping to find him dining with his mother, but the woman had her back to Dee Dee, so she couldn't guess her age. Stop thinking like that. You're done dating for a while. Maybe forever. This was the worst date she'd had, for sure, but it was the capstone on the end of a long line of bad dates. All of her five brothers were married off now, and she'd been feeling lonely. And maybe a little jealous. They were all so happy and she missed her twin brother Finn. He was still her best friend, but he had a wife now, and things just weren't the same. Her mystery hero followed Neil to the door and then returned to Dee Dee. Thank you. 
she avoided his smoldering eyes. You're welcome. Are you all set? Do you need anything? He glanced at the table, and she wondered if he was thinking about how she would pay for their uneaten meal. I'm okay. You get back to your date. She was hoping he'd argue, say, no, that's my ma, but he didn't. He only smiled and left her standing there. The server handed her a box of food and said, would you like to take his home too? I was watching. He didn't touch it. Chapter 2 Isaac Bishop walked out of his job interview, ripped his tie off, and threw it into his truck. That could not have gone more poorly. He was embarrassed, but the interviewer's instincts were correct. Isaac was not a good fit for that position. He didn't know if he'd ever be a good fit for any position, not one that involved other people. He started his truck and pointed it back toward West Hope, where he was temporarily staying with his mother. Not because he couldn't afford a place. He could. After growing up as poor as a crow, he was smart with his money. But he didn't want to rent or buy a place until he knew where he was going to work. And finding a place to work was proving to be harder than he thought it would be. On paper, he looked completely hireable. A decorated veteran, he'd come home to South Dakota in great physical and mental health, with glowing recommendations. He'd had no trouble getting interviews. But then he'd been honest in those interviews. He didn't know how to be any other way. And he'd admitted that he wasn't the most patient person when it came to foolishness. But there weren't a lot of jobs that paid well and allowed him to avoid people. He was daydreaming about being a wilderness photographer when he drove by the first gate of the Bannon Ranch. The night before, his mother had suggested that he ask for a job there. To satisfy her, he checked their website and social media pages to see if they were hiring, but they had nothing posted. This was something of a relief. He liked the Bannons, but it would be a blow to his pride to have to work for Liam. He'd gone to high school with Liam. They'd been peers. He had nothing against the man and had never heard a bad word about him, but still. Working for an old classmate? That felt wrong somehow. You know what else is a blow to your pride? An annoying voice in his head piped up. Being a grown man and living with your mother. He stepped on the brake and started looking for the main entrance to the Bannon Ranch. It soon came into view, and he pulled up the driveway, wondering if he should have emailed first. He didn't even have a resume on him. Oh well, too late now. Folks had seen him approaching, and it would be downright suspicious if he turned around now. The yard was full of life. People, horses, and one dog bustling about. Maybe this job wouldn't let him escape humankind either. He hadn't realized this ranch was such a vibrant place. Despite growing up West River, he hadn't spent much time on ranches. He parked his truck, got out, and tucked in his shirt. He didn't know where the tie had ended up and it would probably do more harm than good here anyway. He strode confidently across the yard. Can I help you? A spunky woman asked. Maybe. I'm looking for Liam if he's not busy. Oh yeah. He's in the horse barn. Follow me. Isaac could have found the horse barn without an escort, but he followed her anyway and found Liam deeply engrossed in a conversation with his brother Patrick. Patrick's face broke into a broad smile when he saw Isaac. Bishop, he called out and abandoned the conversation to give him a big, hearty hug. I heard you were home, man. Welcome back. Thanks. Same to you. Liam also smiled, a little more reserved than his brother. Welcome home. And thank you for your service. Isaac looked down. He knew the thank yous were always meant well, but they still made him uncomfortable. What can we do for you? Liam asked. Well, this might seem out of the blue, but I was wondering if you needed any help around here. Liam didn't have to think about it. Aww. No. I'm sorry. This is a bad time of year for hiring. Maybe in the spring, though? Isaac nodded. Hey. Patrick said brightly. I hear ExpertNet is hiring. Isaac couldn't place the name. The internet company. They're putting in all new wires. Trying to launch us into the current century. 
Patrick chuckled at his own joke. That didn't sound that crazy. Do you know if they'd send me into people's homes? Patrick seemed to know what he was getting at. I think so, yeah. That's a deal breaker, huh? Isaac sighed. Don't want to go into homes? Liam didn't get it. It's not that. I, it's been a while since I've had to deal with everyday people complaining about everyday things. Turns out I'm not too good at it. Liam nodded. Boy do I understand that. I wish I could help, but you'd just be standing around at this point. Understood. Appreciate the minute, though. He nodded to Patrick and then found his own way out of the massive horse barn. It was new. Not only had he not seen it before, but it smelled new. He climbed into his truck, eager to get moving again. They'd been kind, but he still hadn't been comfortable. Felt too much like groveling. Maybe he should look into getting a job at a funeral home. Lots of job security, and dead people didn't whine much. Chapter 3 Dee Dee paced in her bedroom. It was the middle of the night, but she was wound tighter than a spring. Someone kept messaging her via social media. As soon as she'd realized that she didn't know him, she'd blocked him, but then he tried again. Different name. Same photo. It had freaked her out, and that was four profiles ago. She had no reason to think it was Neil, and yet, she did. She'd gotten up and locked all her doors and windows. This was West Hope, South Dakota. No one ever locked their doors, but she was locking them tonight. Then she tried to watch TV and distract herself, but her phone kept beeping. Now he was on several apps, always with the same photo. A generic-looking guy in front of an American flag. Finally she turned her phone all the way off, but that did nothing to comfort her. She knew he was still out there, sending her creepy messages. Would you like to go on a cruise with me? How many children do you want? I can take you for a private flight in my plane. You're so beautiful. How are you still single? It was Neil, and this was so creepy. She was going to kill her friend Sophie, who'd set her up with him. Dee Dee wasn't an unattractive woman. She didn't need a matchmaker, but she was a Bannon. She was wary of dating someone who might just be interested in her bank account. And she lived in West Hope, where everyone had known everyone since kindergarten. There weren't many eligible bachelors, and those who existed didn't interest her. And Sophie had said that Neil was a firefighter from Rapid City. He'd sounded awesome. Dee Dee must have misunderstood. Something had been really off about that man, and whether or not this was him sending these messages now, she never wanted to be anywhere near him again. A loud bang sounded to her left, and she let out a small squeal as she jumped. She froze, not breathing, listening. Messaging her on her social media apps and commenting on her photos from a year ago was one thing, but actually being on her property? That was a whole new level of not okay. What should she do? Call the sheriff? No, she couldn't. What would she tell them, that she'd heard a bang? That would be embarrassing. Maybe she should call Liam. No, he had to get up in a few hours and run a ranch. Maybe she should drive to the ranch right now. No, she didn't want to leave the house. Not in the dark. She climbed into bed and prayed. For safety, protection, and most of all, peace of mind. Please calm me down, God. She didn't hear anything else, and eventually she drifted into a fitful sleep. When the sun rose in the sky, she got up, got herself ready, packed a small bag, and then stuck her head out the front door. The coast looked clear. Her street looked as peaceful as it always looked. And suddenly, her fear seemed a little silly. And if she drove to the ranch and asked to sleep there for a few nights, they would want to know why. And if she told them, they would overreact. She didn't want that to happen. She was already embarrassed. She didn't want more drama, which would be even more embarrassing. She didn't want anyone to know she'd been out with such a loser. Liam would probably lecture her for going out on a blind date without telling him. So she dropped her bag and made herself some breakfast. Then, after a deep breath and another quick prayer, she dared to fire her phone back up. 
as expected, it blew up with notifications. She was no IT expert, so she took screenshots of the most disturbing messages and comments, and then went to work on her privacy settings. She jacked everything up to the max, making it impossible to message her or comment on her stuff unless she granted access first. She knew that nothing was foolproof. They could still assault her with follow requests, but this was better than reading creepy comments about her picture of legend, their family dog. She shuddered. Her phone had quieted down, and she saw the time. Shoot. She was late for church. She rushed to the door and then paused to survey her surroundings before hurrying to her car. She locked it as soon as she climbed in and then buckled up, glancing at the clock. Ma was going to have a fit. But she made good time getting across town and got to church with a few minutes so spare. She put her head down and rushed through the lobby, trying to avoid friendly greetings that would slow her down, and made a beeline for the Bannon Rome near the front, when she saw something that nearly made her fall over in shock. Chapter 4 Isaac hadn't been to church in years, and it was weird to be back. He was received as a hero, which made him uncomfortable, and when he finally extricated himself from the friendly crowd, he realized his mother had parked herself right behind the sprawling Bannon crew. Terrific. He hadn't told her that he'd stopped and asked about a job. He'd been a little embarrassed to be rejected. She was probably planning to try to get him a job herself. He hurried to join her so that he could prevent that from happening. Callum saw him coming and extended his hand. Liam told me you stopped by, he said, plenty loud enough for Isaac's mother to hear. Sorry I missed your visit. Welcome home. Isaac smiled awkwardly, not sure what to say. Callum leaned closer and lowered his voice. I was surprised that Liam turned you away, even scolded him a little, but he said he didn't want to insult you with making up a job. He didn't want you to think it was an act of charity. But if you are in the mood for a change come spring, we can find plenty for you to do then. Isaac was touched that Liam had put so much thought into his answer. He hadn't just rejected him, he'd really tried to think about what was best for him. It surprised him. Thank you. I appreciate that. He really hoped he'd have another job before spring, but if not, this was a good backup plan. He turned to look at his seat before lowering himself into it. There were lots of kids around, and he didn't want to accidentally squish one. And that's when he saw her rushing down the aisle like a beautiful tornado. Her purse was slung over her shoulder, but one strap dangled helplessly, threatening to spill the purse's ample contents onto the floor. With her bright purple skirt twisted around her knees like that, it was a wonder she hadn't tripped. And her hair was an absolute disaster. Had she driven to church with all the windows down? In December? But good grief was she beautiful. Even more so now than she had been all dressed up in the restaurant on Friday night. He sat and tried not to stare, but it was hard not to look at her. She was both dazzling and amusing. She was sliding into her family's pew when she saw him, and then she stopped in her tracks. Her expression almost made him laugh, but he didn't want to embarrass her. They were only feet apart, but it was a little too far to speak. A deacon stepped up to the pulpit and welcomed them all to the service before Isaac or Dee Dee could say anything. She gave him a small smile and a cute little wave before squeezing in between Liam and her mother. The deacon started praying, and Dee Dee leaned close to Liam and whispered something that Isaac couldn't make out. Liam whispered back, loudly enough that Ma Bannon shushed him. Isaac didn't hear what he'd said either, but he did clearly hear his name. And then the deacon said Amen, and Isaac clearly heard the beautiful Dee Dee Bannon say, He's crazy, before the piano started to play. Isaac got to his feet and opened his hymnal. If it weren't for his mother, he would have left. But this would have embarrassed her, and he was glad that she was going to church, so he didn't want to do anything to make her not want to come back. But he couldn't believe what he'd just heard. Is that what Dee Dee thought of him? And why? Did she assume that all veterans had mental health issues? And even if he did, he didn't deserve to be called crazy. That wasn't very kind or understanding. The Bannons were kind of famous for their compassion, but maybe Dee Dee had missed out on that particular gene. He looked around the congregation, wondering how many of these people thought he was nuts. Maybe he'd made a mistake. Maybe he shouldn't have come back here. 
When he'd been in the Middle East, he'd daydreamed constantly about getting back home. But maybe he should have gone somewhere else, started over somewhere new. Chapter 5 Didi's social media harassment continued in force. She reported the abuse to each of the apps, hoping they could block the offender's IP or something. She didn't really know how it worked, but she was sure that these companies didn't want their apps being used to torment people. But while she waited for them to review her cases, the follow requests continued, and she deleted all social media from her phone. It will be good for me, she told herself. She was just taking a little break. A cleansing period. Then, early on Friday night, exactly one week after she ditched Neil in the restaurant, Dee Dee heard a noise in her backyard that made the hair on the back of her neck stand at attention. She held her breath and listened. What had that been? She visualized her backyard, wondering what could have made that noise, that thud. It had sounded like a metal shovel hitting a rubber garbage pail, but she didn't have either of those things on her property. And she doubted anyone had lugged a shovel and a rubber trash can into her backyard. And then she heard it again, and grew frustrated that she couldn't place the sound. She crept to the window and pulled her frilly curtain back an inch. Her backyard wasn't lit, but she saw movement, which meant, if he was in the backyard, he wasn't in the front one. She grabbed her purse and flew out the front door, getting into her car in a flash. She locked the door with her left hand and started the car with her right. As her headlights popped on, they lit a figure in a dark-colored hooded sweatshirt. She only saw him for a second, though, because he darted behind a bush. Neil? Maybe. She backed out so fast that her tires squealed. And then she was on her way to the ranch with her eyes on the rearview mirror more than they were on the road. She was there in record time, and even though she was confident that she wasn't being followed, who would be crazy enough to stalk her onto this ranch, she still ran inside. Only once she'd slammed the door behind her and leaned on it did she start to relax. Ah, the wonderful confidence that comes with being home. So safe. So normal. She opened her eyes to see her teenage nephew staring at her, a bowl of neon-colored cereal in his hand. Is someone chasing you? he asked, his mouth full. No, she forced a laugh. I'm good. Callum came out of his office and saw her. He scowled. What's wrong? Nothing. His scowl deepened. Without a word he told his son to skedaddle, and David disappeared. The sound of his crunching faded down the hall. The fake fruit smell of his snack lingered behind him. The whole foyer smelled like fruit taffy. She didn't even like cereal, but the smell made her mouth water. Maybe she'd ask one of her relatives who wasn't being stalked to pop into town for some Skittles. Get in here. Callum headed back into the office. Grudgingly, she followed, frantically brainstorming how to make this go away. She wasn't going to lie to her brother, but she didn't necessarily have to tell him the whole truth either. He sat in his chair and waited. And her brain was completely blank. She sank into one of the other chairs and stared back. I'm always happy to see you, sis, but even for you, this is weird. She quirked an eyebrow. How so? She was at the ranch more than she was at her own house. You came up the drive at about 50 miles per hour, and then you slammed the door so hard you shook the house. He glanced out the window. So, who's giving you trouble? Fine. He'd already figured out most of it. And no way was he going to let it go. Someone was in my backyard. Who? I don't know. He looked shocked. Are you actually lying to me right now? She sighed. Not exactly. So, who is it? And why on earth would you try to protect such a creep? I'm not protecting him, she snapped. She put her head in her hand. It's just so embarrassing. I'm your big brother. No reason for you to be embarrassed with me. Ever. It was a sweet thing to say. It didn't make her less embarrassed. I went on a particularly bad date last Friday. With who? I don't know if it was him in my backyard, but he said his name was Neil Clinton. He said? You think he gave you a fake name? 
I don't know, but he lied about a lot in a very short amount of time, so I looked him up online and couldn't find him. She sat up straighter. Who can't be found online these days? Callum was already typing on his keyboard. He said he was a firefighter in Rapid. His typing picked up speed. I'm not seeing him either. No kidding. She knew how to do an internet search. So, I ended the date early, and since then, I've been harassed by someone online. The person keeps changing their name, but I figure it might be him. And then tonight I heard and saw someone. You saw him? No, I saw a dark figure in the dark. He was wearing a hoodie. I have no idea what he looked like. Was he the same shape and size? I don't know. I'm not a cop. No kidding you're not a cop, Liam said from behind her. You'd tell the bad guy jokes and then buy him coffee. What are you doing here? Callum asked. Blade saw Jesse Combs coming up the driveway and texted me that something was wrong. So, what's up? Dee Dee has a stalker, Callum said matter-of-factly. Liam's spine straightened. Say what, now? She went on a date with someone named Neil Clinton, and now he's harassing her. Liam looked at her. Have you called the sheriff? I don't know that he's the one doing it. I can't just go accusing someone of. Liam looked at Callum. Call Bill right now. Dee Dee rolled her eyes. You don't need to call Bill. But Callum was dialing the phone. Bill was a deputy in the county sheriff's department. Callum and he had been friends for a long time. After a short burst of friendly small talk, Callum filled him in. He listened for a minute and then looked at Dee Dee. Do you have a picture of the guy? Of course not. When exactly was she supposed to have snapped a photo of him? Where did you meet him? Callum asked, and Dee Dee's embarrassment became overwhelming. Sophie set it up. And you didn't see a picture of him before agreeing to go out with him? I did not. I'm not a shallow twit. Okay, call Sophie and find out everything she knows about him. How about you stop bossing me around, she snapped as she stood to do as she was told. She pulled out her phone and headed out to the hallway. Liam gave her a very judgy look, and she tried to shoot it back at him. She hadn't done anything wrong here. How dare these two big oafs treat her like an idiot. I'll call you back when I have more info, Bill. Thanks for your help. She shut the office door and called Sophie. But Sophie didn't answer. Dee Dee hung up and shot her a text message. Then she went back into the office. Every deputy is busy right now, but he says he can put one on your house if you want to go home. She groaned. Can I just stay here? Of course you can, Callum said. You never need to ask that. But an easy fix to this problem is to catch him in the act. You want to use me as bait? He gave her a small smile. Something like that, yeah. We would make sure he never gets anywhere near you. I'm tired. I just want to go to bed. Tell Bill I don't need a deputy following me around. Then I'll hire you some private security. She let out a peal of laughter. That's insane. Dee Dee, you're a beautiful heiress. I'm surprised this is your first stalker. Callum, I live in South Dakota. No one gets stalked in South Dakota. I think that's a good idea, Callum. That buddy of yours still run that security company? Callum nodded. He sure does. Let me give him a call. No. Dee Dee shrieked. Will you two please calm down? If not, I'm going to go get Ma. Liam laughed. You don't think Ma will be on our side? You're her baby. I'm hoping she'll land somewhere in the middle. That's how it usually went, anyway. Wait a second. Liam rubbed his jaw. He had an idea. What is it? Callum asked. What about Isaac Bishop? Callum's face lit up. Who? Dee Dee was near panicking. I mean, he's not trained, Liam said, totally ignoring her. But he was a Marine. I'm sure he could handle it. And he could probably be here within minutes. 
We don't need someone here within minutes. And who is Isaac Bishop? The name sounded irritatingly familiar, but she couldn't place it. Liam went to school with him, Callum said, as if that explained anything. The guy from church, Liam said. He sat behind us. You asked me his name and said he was. Oh. Her head felt light all of a sudden. That guy? Good grief. That might not be so bad. Why would he want to follow me around? He asked for a job, Callum said. I don't know, maybe it would be better to get someone who's trained. Like I said, Marine. And it might be good to keep it local. Don't I get a say in all this? Callum looked at her. Sure, go ahead. She bit her lip. She didn't want any bodyguards, but if she had to choose between a deputy, a stranger, or a supermodel, well. The truth is, Isaac would be a good fit if he's willing. She took a quick breath. He knows what he looks like. What? Callum said. Yeah. He was in the restaurant. He actually came to my rescue. Rescue? Liam nearly shouted. You needed rescue? No. I had it handled, but the jerk grabbed my arm pretty hard. Isaac was at a table nearby, and he jumped up and got between us. It was very, gallant. She looked around for something to fan herself with. Liam slapped his legs. Sounds like it's meant to be. He looked at Callum. And I'll be his backup. He nodded as if it was already decided. I'm comfortable with him. Didn't Isaac have to agree with all this too? Chapter 6 Isaac didn't recognize the number that was calling, so he didn't answer it, and when he heard the voicemail from ExpertNet, he was glad that he hadn't answered. Because he still didn't know whether or not he wanted this job. And now he had to make up his mind because he had to call them back. He needed a job, and this was a good one. Good pay. Decent benefits. He didn't want to look a gift horse in the mouth. And maybe he could manage to not lose his cool when people acted like slow internet service was a life or death matter. Maybe. He took a deep breath and picked up the phone. He would take the job. It would be okay. Thank you, God, for this opportunity. Please help me be less irritable. The phone rang in his hand. He didn't recognize this number either, but it was local. Who would be calling him from West Hope? His curiosity got the best of him, and he answered. Morning. This is Liam Bannon. Tell me you haven't found your dream job yet. I sure haven't. He couldn't help but be suspicious. Liam had already told him that there was nothing for him to do at the Bannon Ranch. Good. We might have something for you. No pressure, but something's come up. I hear you intercepted a real jerk for Didi in Rapid City a week or so ago. I wish I'd known about that when I talked to you because I would have thanked you. Oh, it was nothing. I didn't even know who she was. He winced. Why had he said that? Well it speaks to your character that you came to her aid. The truth is that somebody is harassing her, maybe doing more than harassing. We don't know that it's the same guy from the restaurant but I have a bad feeling. The sheriff's department is looking into it, but Dee Dee isn't really taking it as seriously as I wish she would. Liam paused, but Isaac didn't have anything to say. Anyway, the job offer is to be her chaperone or bodyguard or whatever you want to call to it till we get this whole thing figured out. He was struck speechless. Hang out with the rich brat who said he was crazy? No, thank you. And then he pictured all of the people within a hundred miles who wanted their video games not to lag. I know what you're thinking. Isaac didn't think that he did. You don't want to waste time on something short term, but we could really use your help on this, so we'll make it worth your while financially. I know that I don't know you that well, but you're local, you're a marine, and I trust you. We don't need to know right now, but if you get back to us soon. I'll help. Isaac jumped at his own words. He will. The truth was, he was so relieved to have an out from the internet job, that he wasn't being completely prudent here. But Dee Dee was just one person, one person who, so far, didn't seem to be the whiny type. 
and he didn't have to be friends with her. He just had to follow her around, keep her safe, and get paid well. Liam was talking about salary and insurance, and Isaac tried to tune back in. When do I start? He asked as soon as Liam gave him a chance. As soon as you're willing. I can be there in 30 minutes. It only took him 25. Dee Dee met him at the door. Thank you for doing this. I'm so sorry to get you dragged into it again. Again? She shook her head, flustered. I just meant the restaurant. Okay, I have to get going. How should we do this? Do you want to ride together? It seems silly to take two vehicles to Hot Springs. Hot Springs. What was going on? They didn't tell you? He didn't even know who they was. Callum stepped into the foyer. We have some paperwork for you to fill out. It's in my office. Isaac started that way, but Dee Dee stopped him with a gentle hand on his upper arm. As soon as she made contact she yanked her hand away as if she'd been burned. Then their eyes locked, and they stared at each other awkwardly for a moment. He ripped his eyes away. No need to be noticing how beautiful her dark eyes were. She was an illy informed, judgmental, rich girl. He looked at Callum. Do you need me to do that right now? She says she needs to get to Hot Springs. Callum looked at the time. You have to leave already? I need to pick up the graves before they start. Callum raised his eyebrows. That's your job? It's pretty cold out there. I'm one of the people who help with that job, but there are hundreds and hundreds of graves. Okay. Callum looked at Isaac. Up to you. If you're more comfortable doing it now, she can wait. Those people have been dead for a hundred years, they can wait a few more minutes. Or you can do it when you get back. Hundreds of graves? Dead people? What had he signed up for exactly? Do you want me to drive her? Absolutely, if you don't mind. You can take one of the company trucks. He pointed to a board of keys hanging on the wall. Sorry that your first day she's got you running all over the state. Do you want me to send a wrangler along too? No, thank you. I think I got this. He didn't even know what this was. Callum slapped him on the back. Thank you. I have no doubt that you do. Call us if you need anything, and enjoy your drive. Feeling a bit dizzy from all of the new input, Isaac looked at the keys on the hook. Do you have a preference? He didn't care about making her happy so much as making a decision. He had no idea which keys to pick. She stepped so close to him that he could smell her shampoo. It smelled like tea tree, and the scent woke him up a little. She grabbed a set of keys and handed it to him. My favorite. Then she started toward the door. Hang on a second. He stepped in front of her. I know a lot of what I'm going to do will seem like overkill to you, but please don't complain about it. I've been hired to do a job, and I'm going to do it the best I can, so if you think something I do is foolish, please keep that to yourself. Her beautiful eyes widened. I wasn't going to complain. He nodded. Good. Thank you. I'm just going to have a look around the yard, and then you can come out. He could sense that she was annoyed, but to her credit, she kept it to herself. He opened the door, slipped outside, and scanned his surroundings. There were lots of people, and a stalker would have to be completely insane to try something here, but he studied the scene carefully just in case. It looks good. Come on. He stayed close to her and then helped her into the truck. Then he slid behind the wheel of the nicest vehicle he'd ever driven. Okay. He started the truck. Why are we going to Hot Springs? We are putting Christmas wreaths on the graves of Civil War veterans. Oh wow. This just kept getting worse and worse. That's an old cemetery. Yes, it is. That's how I got involved. Not a lot of family members lining up to volunteer. So they called you? That seemed so random. I sort of have a reputation for doing stuff like this. She giggled. She wasn't bragging at all, just sharing about herself. 
You volunteer a lot? It's sort of my full-time gig. You don't have a job? He wished he hadn't sounded so surprised. Of course she didn't. Why would she need to work? Her great-grandfather had gotten lucky and made them all filthy rich. He ground his teeth together and silently scolded himself for being petty and covetous. Sorry, father, he silently prayed. I've had jobs, but I think I can do more good for the world if I don't have regular hours. I know it sounds weird, but volunteering keeps me pretty busy. He didn't know what to think about that, and he didn't comment. They'd only gone 20 miles when it started to snow. He silently scolded himself for setting out without checking the forecast first. Why is it snowing? She cussed softly, and he couldn't help but laugh. What? She stared at him. I just didn't think the Bannons were cussers. You guys are all such perfect Christians. Hardly, she scoffed. And that word doesn't even count as a cuss unless you're my grandmother. He laughed even harder and then silently scolded himself again. He didn't need to be enjoying this. He did not need to be having fun. He needed to remember what she really thought of him. So you do a lot of stuff for veterans? That didn't make sense. If she didn't respect them, why was she trying to honor them? No more than any other group. I'm equally attentive to homeless dogs and library patrons. Chapter 7 By the time they reached Hot Springs, the snow was really coming down. Dee Dee could tell that Isaac wasn't happy to be driving in this weather, and she felt bad. Are they really going to have this thing in a blizzard? Isaac didn't even try to hide his criticism. I don't know. She tried to keep her voice even, to not show that she was annoyed that he was annoyed. I'm not the one in charge, but I'm also not scared of a little snow and wind. She pulled her beanie on over her hair. Yes, he was gorgeous, but he was also grumpy. Maybe she wasn't interested after all. Too bad because other than his sourpuss attitude, he seemed to be a perfect specimen of a man. He drove the rest of the way to the cemetery in silence, and she let him have his quiet. She'd already tried to make conversation over the last hundred miles and hadn't had much luck. This cowboy wasn't much for chit-chat. She'd even tried asking him about his life, but he clammed right up. Too bad. She was interested in hearing from people who'd been overseas, who'd seen other parts of the world that were so different from hers. There were very few people at the cemetery, and she was glad she was early. Now what, he asked. Now I just go around and make sure that all the trash is picked up. Dead flowers, plastic decorations, stuff like that. Then we'll place the wreaths. Do you want some help? Only if you want to. Actually, he studied their surroundings. I don't want you to think I'm lazy. I'm definitely willing to help, but maybe I should focus on watching and listening. I don't even think anyone other than immediate family knows that I'm here. Normally I would post this kind of stuff on my social media. Makes the ranch look good, but I've got all that fun stuff shut down right now. He nodded, his jaw tight. Good for you. She ripped her eyes away from his jawline. She didn't need to be looking at that. You do whatever you think is best. I won't judge. And I would never think you're lazy. Obviously. How many lazy marines were there in the world? Zero? Something like a smile tried to appear, but Isaac squelched it. The good news is this is a nice, open space, so it'll be easy to see a threat coming. Good news. She got out of the truck and headed toward her friend Ricardo, who was in charge. Ricardo greeted her with a big hug and then looked over her shoulder, some suspicion in his eyes. That's my friend, she said quickly, loudly enough for Isaac to hear. She didn't need Ricardo or anyone knowing that she had a bodyguard. She was still having trouble believing that she had one. Ricardo offered Isaac a handshake. Welcome. The more the merrier. Well, I better get started before the snow tries to hide everything. She looked around for some trash bags, and her eyes landed on a roll of them on top of a folding table. Two other volunteers were already unboxing wreaths. Right over there. Ricardo pointed. I'll grab one too. 
Dee Dee started around the cemetery. There wasn't much to pick up, so it was easy to get it all. On the third row, Ricardo asked her why her friend was just standing around watching the snow fall. Okay, she crept closer to Ricardo so no one else could hear her. I didn't want to tell you, but I sort of have a stalker, so Isaac is my friend but is also sort of my unofficial bodyguard. So he's not helping because he's watching for people who aren't supposed to be here. Oh. Now Ricardo's head was on a swivel. I promise you, nothing is going to happen here. My brothers are just very protective. Isaac's your brother? Oh gosh, no. She bit her tongue. Maybe she protested that a little too aggressively. No, but they're paying him to do the job. Ricardo looked scared and confused. She took a deep breath. Isaac is a veteran. He's only been home a few weeks. He's a Marine. She heard the pride in her own voice and was a little bit embarrassed. She had no right to be proud of him. She caught Isaac looking at her, and there was suspicion in his eyes. Had he heard what she said? If so he could hear like an elephant. She flashed him a small smile, which he did not return. Anyway, I promise, Ricardo. He's just here because my brothers are overprotective. Nothing is going to happen. No one even knows I'm here. Okay. He didn't sound convinced. She gave him a smile that he hoped was reassuring, and then she went back to her trash pickup, once again wondering why Isaac was so grumpy. By the time the trash was all bagged up, her toes were pretty cold, but her heart was warm. A few more people had arrived to help, and they started neatly placing a wreath on each grave. She would pause for a moment in front of each old stone and say, Thank you for your service. Thank you for your sacrifice. Merry Christmas. And then she would move on. Once or twice with each row she would pause and look to see where Isaac was, and most of the time his eyes were on her, though on occasion he did scan the slope behind her. At one point, when the wreaths were all placed, she couldn't find him and panicked a little, and then she saw him standing in front of the large monument on the slope. Thinking it might be a good idea to move her legs a little faster and harder to warm up her toes, she headed in that direction. Beautiful, isn't it? He glanced at her and then returned his eyes to the monument, which read, in memory of the men who offered their lives in defense of this country. Yes, it's beautiful. I've actually never been here. It's a nice spot. He nodded contemplatively. We should get back. Okay. She started down the slope, expecting him to follow, and he did. Ricardo did not know the names of all the veterans they were honoring, but he read the ones that he did have a record of, and it was an impressive list. Usually, when these ceremonies were over, Dee Dee would linger and schmooze with everybody, but she didn't want to make Isaac sit through that. We can go if you want. His relief was unmistakable. Okay. He gestured toward the truck, and she headed that way, hurrying to climb in before he could help her, and then waited for him to get behind the wheel before saying, I'm so sorry. It stinks that the first day of your new job is at a veteran's cemetery. He didn't say anything. Do you want me to take a turn with the driving? I know you weren't hired as a chauffeur. No, he said quickly. I'll drive, if you don't mind. She raised an eyebrow and tried to sound playful. You're not one of those men who think women can't drive in the snow, are you? The thought never crossed my mind. There was no playfulness in his words. Well at least my stalker didn't show up. Maybe he's not as crazy as we think. I don't think you know the first thing about crazy. What on earth did that mean? Good grief. I'm starving. Would you mind stopping on the way back for a bite to eat? If it's necessary. It was clear he didn't want to stop, but she really was hungry. It's my treat. I can afford my own food, he snapped. You know what? I've been nothing but friendly, and you're being a grouch. So fine, I will eat when I get back to the ranch. Can I turn the music up, or will that offend you somehow? She didn't wait for him to answer. She reached over and pressed the volume button. He spoke over the music. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to be a grouch. You're a successful guy. 
I'm sure you can find a better job if you don't want this one. He sighed and tightened his grip on the wheel. I want this job, but that's what it is. A job. We don't need to be friends. Oh, don't you worry about that. Maybe she'd been wrong. Maybe she should have gone with the deputy. Chapter 8 Blade plopped down at the vast kitchen table across from Dee Dee. Why are you acting like you're under house arrest? Dee Dee scowled. What are you talking about? You've been hiding out here for a week. Didn't you have some Save the Planet function Wednesday that you were supposed to go to? Dee Dee avoided eye contact. Is it that cowboy bodyguard? Is he driving you nuts? Dee Dee looked at the door. She needed to escape this kitchen. And this interrogation. Do you want me to tell Liam to fire him? No. Dee Dee said quickly. That was the last thing she wanted. While it was true that he was the reason that she was avoiding going out, that didn't mean that he deserved to be fired. He was doing his job. He was a good man. She didn't want to mess up his life. If you don't hurry up and spill it, I'm just going to have to get more involved. Do you want me to go talk to Isaac about it? Blade cocked one obnoxious eyebrow. Despite herself Dee Dee laughed. Are you trying to be my least favorite sister-in-law? I certainly am not. But come on. This is unsustainable. You need to get out there and live your life. And if it's the stalker who's holding you back, then we need to talk about that. And if it's the bodyguard that's holding you back, then you should get a new bodyguard. I don't want a new bodyguard. I want this one. Oh no. I didn't mean to say it like that, she said quickly. But it was too late. Blade was already making assumptions. Oh, she said slowly. So that's the problem. You're falling for him. What, does he not like you back? Because if not, then I really do need to go talk to him because that means something's wrong with. I'm not falling for anybody. I've only known him a week. So what? He's a big bottle of hot sauce. Took me about two seconds to figure out that I loved hot sauce. Now I can't live without it. Dee Dee finally met her eyes. Was Blade messing with her? Yes, a little. I'm telling Liam that you said Isaac was hot sauce. Blade giggled mischievously. I might have already mentioned it. Dee Dee rolled her eyes. Of course she had. How had her straight-laced brother ever ended up paired with this woman? She didn't know, but Blade made him wildly happy. I'm fine, Dee Dee said. Thank you for your concern, but really. She gathered her dishes, got up and took them to the sink, and then smiled at her sister-in-law. There's more pumpkin pie in the fridge. She left the room feeling unsettled. Blade had a point, even if she delivered it obnoxiously. It was a little weird that she was holed up here like she was afraid of the world. She wasn't afraid. But it was so awkward going anywhere with Isaac. She liked him, and he didn't like her back. That stung. But worse than that was that he was grumpy. And his grumpiness came in spurts. It was like he would catch himself relaxing and smiling, realize he wasn't supposed to be doing those things, and then turn sour. It was so strange. Maybe it was time to move back to her house. She hadn't seen Hyde nor hair of Neil in a week. It was probably safe to go home, and then she could hide there if she still needed to avoid going out. Yeah, that was a good idea. She would go home. At least then she could hide out without being judged by her in-laws. She found Isaac on the front porch, practically standing at attention. She took a deep breath and stepped outside. Hi, he said. Hi, yourself. She took a steadying breath. Just being around him made her feel like she'd drunk too much coffee. As my official protector, what would you think about me moving back to my house? As your official protector, I would think that it is entirely up to you, and I will support whatever decision you make. I'm asking for your opinion here. Please? I value your insight. Then I think it's about high time. I don't know if this guy's done being a menace, but if he tries anything, I will make sure that he fails. 
I haven't heard anything from him in a week, even on social media. Do you think maybe he's given up? I have no idea. I don't have some special insight into how crazy people's minds work. And there was the grumpiness. Good grief. Okay. Let's go home then. Okay. Let's. She turned to go back inside. I'm bored out of my skull here. Are you kidding? This ranch is far from boring. She turned back to the yard and scanned the property, drinking in the scenery that she usually took for granted. You're right. It's pretty cool stuff, but I grew up here. And I don't get as excited about cattle as my brothers do. She didn't even eat much steak. He chuckled, and she just about melted into a puddle on the porch. She stepped away from that smile. Fair enough. You need some help getting your things? No. Just give me two seconds. I only brought one bag. But we do need to stop at the grocery store on the way home if you don't mind. Sure. No problem. Now that a decision had been made, she was excited. She hurried to her room and repacked the bag that she had never really unpacked. Five minutes later she was driving back toward her house. She hadn't even bothered to say, goodbye, to anyone. She didn't want to hear their commentary. She pulled into the grocery store parking lot, put the car in park, and realized she had a new problem. Uh, do you mind if I go in alone? I promise to text you if anything happens. He scowled. Uh, yeah I mind. It's my job to go with you. They don't pay me to sit in the car like a dog. This made her mad. I'll be ten minutes. I'm going in alone. Please, just let me have this. She got out of the car, hoping he didn't follow. If you're not back in ten, I'm coming in, he said before she could shut the door behind her. She nodded. Thank you. She shut the door and headed inside. The truth was that she wanted to fill her cart full of absolute junk and didn't want his judgmental eyes following each snack into the cart. If he went with her, she would buy nothing but green things, and then she would get home and starve to death. She grabbed a cart and looked at the time. She had to hurry. She skipped the produce section altogether and headed straight for the bakery. As she surveyed the cookie offerings she had the eerie feeling that somebody was watching her. Don't be stupid. This is the first time you've gone out into the world in a week, so you're being paranoid. But the feeling didn't leave her, so she looked around, just barely catching a glimpse of the man in grey before he ducked behind an end cap. She gasped. Was that Neil? It could have been. It was his size. No, you're just being crazy. She went to the freezers and got her ice cream. Now she just had to get something salty and something to drink and she'd be on her way to the checkout. But when she steered her cart into the chip aisle, she saw the man again, and though she still didn't get a clear look at him, this time she knew that it was Neil. She took out her phone and hastily texted, please come in. She hit send and then wondered if her message was urgent enough. Her heart was pounding as she typed, he's here. Send. She put her purse strap over her shoulder and then abandoned all of that yummy goodness in her cart as she made a beeline for the door. She didn't even see him this time as he grabbed her arm and yanked her toward the vegetables. No, she tried to scream as he clamped a dry hand over her mouth. Where did he think he was going to take her? They were nowhere near an exit. He was dragging her toward the broccoli. She drove her elbow into his stomach with such force that he relaxed his grip with a grunt. And then, though his hand was moving away from her face, she lunged forward and bit him anyway. He yelped, and she let out a horrific scream, perfectly happy to make a scene. She heard the thunk of fist on flesh before she even saw Isaac. She turned to see Neil sprawled out on the ground, and then in her relief, she forgot about playing it cool and whirled around to bury her face in Isaac's chest. His arm went around her as naturally as if he did it all the time. She fought to calm herself down as he stroked her back. This is Isaac Bishop, he said, and she wondered why he was identifying himself to her before realizing he was on the phone. Someone has just assaulted and tried to abduct Dee Dee Bannon. 
I hit him, and he appears to be unconscious on the floor of Fairway in West Hope. He paused. Then, thank you. She realized that he was still holding her tightly and started to feel self-conscious about it, but she couldn't bring herself to push him away. They asked me to wait here until they get here, he said softly. You want me to ask someone here to walk you to your car? She hated that she was shaking. She was supposed to be tougher than this. That guy had grabbed her. What on earth? What a psychopath. So she stayed right where she was, pressed up against Isaac's body. If you don't mind, I'd rather stay here with you. Nope. I don't mind. Chapter 9 Isaac kept one eye on Dee Dee as her brothers discussed what to do next. The whole situation had finally shaken her, and he didn't like that. He liked the confident, sassy Dee Dee, even if the scared one was the one that had clung to him like a lifeline. Okay, maybe he liked both. But still, he wanted her to perk up. I still think that she should just stay here for a while, Callum said for at least the third time. It's so much simpler, and we've got plenty of room. This was true. This house was crazy huge. No, Dee Dee said again. I'll be fine. Callum looked at Isaac. Maybe it's time to hire you a partner, so that someone can be awake and alert at all times? Would you be comfortable staying right at her house? For a few days anyway? He nodded. If you want to hire someone else, I won't try to stop you, but I've been running on very little sleep for a lot of years now. I'm almost always awake, and I'm always alert. Callum didn't seem to doubt this, which made Isaac happy. And I think we've reached the peak of escalation, Isaac said. Even if he manages to get bailed out, he'll be in much bigger trouble if he comes after her again. I doubt he wants to face that much jail time. He didn't look like the type to survive that much jail time. Isaac had been off balance when he'd hit him and barely made contact. The man had gone down like a scarecrow. So you don't think he'll come after her again? Liam said. I don't know, Isaac admitted. Well if he does, Callum said, then she should be here. Should she? Isaac said, and Callum and Liam stared at him. If he's stupid enough to try something, then we want him to try it sooner rather than later. We want to get this over with. If he hunkers down for months somewhere waiting for her to drop her guard, well then. I don't want to wait that long. So you want him to try something? Dee Dee asked him. He had the urge to go to her and put his arm around her again, but of course, he couldn't. That moment was long over. What I want is for him to go to jail so that you don't have to worry about this ever again. He also wanted to banish him to Patmos, but jail seemed a more achievable goal. Good point, Dee Dee said, surprising him. Everybody's wanting me to be bait, so I'll go home and be bait. I want him in jail too. Callum nodded. Then it's settled. He sounded unhappy, but at least they'd stopped arguing. He looked at Isaac. I'll get you a helper ASAP. You've got this till then? Or do you want me to call the sheriff as well? I got this, Isaac said. But maybe let the sheriff know that she'll be at home. It can't hurt for them to know that. Callum was still nodding. Good point. Okay, then, he stood up. I'm sorry this is happening to you, sis, but I also think it's almost over. How about if I put a wrangler right out front? Liam said, and Dee Dee started to protest. Liam added, he won't even get out of the truck. Can the Wrangler stay invisible? Dee Dee said. We want Neil. I mean, Milton to try something, not get scared off by a ranch hand. Now that he'd been arrested, they'd learned his real identity, Milton Smith. And there was no evidence that he'd ever so much as seen a fire, let alone fought one. Liam sighed. Fine. But I really don't like this. Tell you what, he stood too. I'll put a guy two blocks over. Dee Dee laughed. Fine. Which guy? Does it matter? She shook her head. No, just curious. Well, Holden is the one I trust the most. Dee Dee groaned. Don't do that to Holden. He's family. 
Liam raised his phone to his ear. That's why he's my first choice. Dee Dee stood up. She seemed recharged, somehow. This is good. Hopefully he tries something soon so that I don't have to worry about him at the Christmas gala. The what? She looked at him. Would you like to go home? I mean, would you like to go to my home? She smiled awkwardly. Yes, let's try that again. But you still don't have any groceries. Don't worry. There's an app for that. He didn't understand. I mean that I'll have some delivered. Oh. He started to inquire if one of the ranch hands could do her shopping as he assumed a delivery service would be expensive. Then he remembered that these people had a different definition of the word expensive. He gave the yard a once-over and then walked her out to her car. Want me to drive this time? Sure. I'm still a little rattled, and I can't believe how tired I am. Adrenaline will do that to you. She smiled at him in the moonlight. I guess, you would know, huh? Yeah. I would know. He got her tucked into the car and then slid behind the wheel. Once he was clear of the property, he said, so what exactly is a Christmas gala? Oh, it's this super fun event. It's pretty swanky. At a nice hotel in Rapid. It's a fundraiser. Good food, good music, dancing. We get all gussied up, it's next weekend. She sighed. It's going to be pretty embarrassing to have a bodyguard there, but oh well. Well, do you have a date? She hesitated, and he wished he could take it back. He hadn't meant to ask her out, especially not after the day she'd had. No, not yet, she finally said. Think I should ask Milton? This made him laugh harder than he should have. When he'd recovered, he said, well, if it would be less embarrassing, I could be your date. You know, not really. But I could go as your date and be your bodyguard. But no one would know that I was your employee. He didn't think he'd be an embarrassing date. He looked pretty normal. And he knew how to dance a little. Oh. He didn't know what that o meant, and she didn't elaborate. But you'd have to wear a tux. I can wear a tux. Okay, then. I guess it's a date. Thanks, Isaac. Chapter 10 Dee Dee glanced up as Isaac came back inside after doing another trip around her property's perimeter. Everything okay, in here, he asked. Just like you left it. She couldn't believe how much this man struggled to sit still. He went and stood beside the window. Want to watch some TV? He grunted. She knew he was judging her. She had been consuming an awful lot of television lately. But what else was she going to do? Milton had been bailed out of jail, and her bodyguard was a party pooper. Liam said you were supposed to have lunch with your sister-in-law today? Yeah. That got cancelled. It got cancelled? Or you cancelled it? She stared at his back. What was he getting at? I cancelled it. Told her we'd reschedule once I wasn't being stalked. She clipped her words. She wanted there to be no question that she was annoyed. He finally turned and looked at her. You don't seem the type to hide from this guy. She wasn't. But neither was she the type to hang out with someone who wasn't very nice to her. I'm not hiding. This is just easier. He stepped toward her and put his hands on his hips. You don't seem the type to choose easy just because it's easy. She paused her show. She'd already lost track of what was happening. She looked at him. I'm sorry, are you bored? Is that what this is about? You need me to leave the house because you're tired of my backyard? He shook his head. That's not it at all. Then what is it? She was exasperated. Why do you care what I do? Because I asked Liam if this was normal behavior for you, Anne. You what? Now they were talking about her behind her back? You asked him if what was normal behavior? This? He waved his arm at her. You're still in your pajamas. Don't you dare judge me. It's not my fault that I don't want to go out, she stopped herself. 
Never mind. She unpaused the show and stared at the television without seeing it. She could feel his presence and then she felt him coming closer. She wouldn't let herself look at him. He sat in her recliner and faced her. Now she couldn't not look. What? She snapped. It's not all about you. She wanted to punch him. She didn't think it was all about her. What an obnoxious thing to say. The truth is that I feel guilty taking a paycheck for this, or at least, a paycheck as generous as the one I'm getting. So I talked to Liam about it. I wanted to be honest that I haven't exactly been exerting myself the past few days. And he made it clear that you're not, that this isn't how you usually live your life. So that made me think that despite my presence, you don't dare leave your house. And that makes me think that you don't think I can protect you. And I can. He inhaled sharply as if he hadn't breathed in a while. So he was making it all about him. I know that I'm not a trained bodyguard. Callum is currently trying to get me a partner who is one. Maybe, while he's at it, we should tell him to find two, and I'll just go on my merry way. His voice had turned gentle. Is that what you want? Of course not. I want to do my job, keep you safe, and make sure you're able to live your normal life, but you seem unwilling to do that. The gentle voice was gone. Maybe she'd imagined it. I'm not scared of Milton, and I don't want you to quit. I don't doubt your ability to protect me from that little salamander. He chuckled. Then what is it? She couldn't tell him. It would be too mean. Can you please just let this go? Just let me watch my TV show? For the rest of your life? Oh, she cried. That's what this is? You want me to go out so that I'm better bait? No. That's preposterous. What is wrong with you? His bewilderment almost made her laugh. She put her head in her hands. I'm sorry, she mumbled. What's that? She looked up. I said I'm sorry. Fine. She sat up straight. You want the truth? Yes, please. Here's the truth. You, my dear bodyguard, are not much fun. It's easier for me to just stay here so that we don't have to talk much because frankly, when we have conversations, they're not very pleasant. She held her hands out to her sides. I mean, just look at how much fun this one is. Chapter 11 Isaac stared at his charge. What was this woman babbling on about? What, you want me to be more fun? It was a guess. She looked stunned. What? No. I don't need you to be fun. She stabbed herself in the chest. I'm plenty fun enough on my own. I want you to be nice. What? I am nice. He realized that he was shouting. He realized something else too. He hadn't been very nice to her. Sure, he hadn't been mean or rude, but he hadn't been friendly. We're not friends. I'm an employee. She narrowed her eyes at him. I don't want to be friends with you, Isaac. I have loads of friends. I don't need to tell you all my deepest darkest secrets. But you're not pleasant to be around. You're. I'm what? He tried to keep his voice down. You're grumpy. He pictured a wizened old cowboy in a rocking chair and laughed. I'm grumpy? No one had ever accused him of that, at least, not to his face. Yes, grumpy. You're snippy and irritable and judgmental, and I just want to avoid all of it. She sank back into the cushions. So I'm watching my show. He wanted to say, you know why I'm grumpy? Because you said I was crazy. I'm not the judgmental one. You are. You judged me because I was a veteran. And you're a stuck-up, rich little brat. And you're also beautiful, and it is really, really annoying for me to be around someone so beautiful, so yeah, maybe it makes me a little snippy. Instead, he said, so if I promise to be less grumpy, you'll get off the couch? She narrowed her eyes again. You're not off to a good start. You just judged me for being on the couch too much. You are on the couch too much, he said before he could stop himself. 
She glared at him. Sorry, sorry. For real. I'm sorry. I know you're not actually a lazy couch potato. But yes, for real, I will try to be less grumpy. He wasn't going to get used to that word anytime soon. She was quiet for a minute, and he wondered if their conversation was over. Then she calmly said, It's my turn to teach at the children's ministry tonight. At church? She nodded. Perfect. I was thinking that maybe I shouldn't go. Maybe I don't want to attract a lunatic to a place where all those innocent kids are going to be. No, he said quickly. While she made a good point, he wasn't going to let Milton do any more damage. I'll ask Liam to put some extra men around the property. You'll be fine. The kids will be fine. Okay. Okay? Yeah. She threw the blanket off her legs. I guess I'll go. Good. He thought she was going to get up, but she didn't move. Just let me finish this episode first. Then I'll get ready. He forced himself to smile. That sounds like a fine idea. Her eyes twinkled. She knew that he was faking it, but she didn't call him out. Thank you. I'm glad we've had this conversation as unpleasant as it's been because I really do want to go to the gala on Saturday. And it wouldn't be much fun if my date isn't nice to me. Her date. He knew that she was just using that word without meaning it, but he still liked the sound of it. This reminded him that he had to find a tux, and he didn't think there were any rental shops in West Hope. How would you feel about taking a ride into Rapid City tomorrow? I still need to find that tux. Her smile broadened. That could be fun. I promise to let it be fun. Maybe he needed to let it go. So what if she'd called him crazy? She obviously wasn't a bad person. And some vets did act a little crazy. And maybe someone had told her something about him. Folks in West Hope talked way too much, it seemed that the less they knew, the more they talked. He needed to forgive her. He returned to his window and looked outside. Wow, now that he'd decided to do it, it turned out that forgiving her was an incredibly easy thing to do. She had said something careless, but he'd done that before too. So he wasn't going to hold it against her anymore. Yes, her words still stung a little, but he had a feeling that if he stopped being angry about her comment, that the sting would fade a little, with time. And time was going to go by much faster now that he could leave this house. Chapter 12 There were about three times as many kids at church as Isaac expected. Where had they all come from? Did this many children live in West Hope? Or were they bussing them in from Spearfish? As soon as they stepped into the sanctuary, Dee Dee was attacked. A dozen kids ranging from two feet to four feet tall ran straight for her, squealing. Most of them were girls, but plenty of boys were getting their squeals in as well. Miss Dee Dee, they cried as they flung their arms around her. The latecomers ended up flinging their arms around other children who'd gotten there first, and they all squirmed to get closer to her, poor Dee Dee reminded Isaac of a sow being attacked by hungry piglets. Good grief, this woman was loved. Eventually, she fondly shooed them away, and they drifted back toward their seats. Uh, where are you going to put them all? The sanctuary wasn't big enough. Dee Dee giggled. It was cute. We split them up into age groups. Don't worry. Which group do you teach? Well, Finn calls them the small ones, but they are first through fourth graders. Does he have trouble remembering those four numbers? He didn't know Finn well. Just like his beautiful twin sister, Finn had been several years behind Isaac in school. He probably would have been able to recognize them as Bannons, especially the red-headed ones, but other than that, they'd been total strangers. Even back then a part of him had known that they were out of his league, from a different world. He may or may not know what grades they're in. I'm not sure, but he sorted all the kids into categories, extra small, small, medium, large, and extra large. Isaac looked around. Well I see the extra small ones. Those had to be the herd of toddlers near the altar. And I guess, what, the middle school kids are the mediums? So that makes the junior high the large? And then high school is the extra large. 
he felt smart and paused to be a little proud of himself. But Didi cut his proud moment short by shaking her head. You're close. Junior high and middle school are together, 5th through 8th grade, so they're all the mediums. Then the high schoolers are the largest. Now he was perplexed. So who are the extra largest, the adults? Didi stepped closer to him conspiratorially, and he got another whiff of her tea tree shampoo. She lowered her voice to say, see that man in the back in the blue and orange t-shirt? Isaac's eyes located him, and he nodded. Yeah. He still didn't get it. The man was tall and thin. Not much of an extra large. Well, he graduated from the high school group a few years ago, and he just kept coming. We don't really know how to get rid of him, and so Finn started calling him the extra-large child. He's the only member of that particular group size. In fact, I think it was his refusal to fly out of the nest that prompted Finn to create the whole sizing system in the first place. Isaac was laughing before she even finished her explanation, and then he felt guilty. He didn't even know the man. He really shouldn't be laughing at him. But he couldn't seem to stop himself. Sorry, I don't mean to laugh at that man's expense, but that's just so strange. He got himself under control and said, maybe somebody should look into it. It could be an unsafe situation. I've heard that the leadership has, though I don't know. And I think they deemed him harmless. Sorry. Maybe I'm just a cynic, but I can't think of another reason why a dude that old would want to participate in a children's ministry. Dee Dee shrugged. I don't know. We have pretty good snacks and get pizza once a month. Is tonight pizza night? She surprised him with genuine sadness. No, sorry. But we can get pizza afterward. He saw her flinch at her own words, as if she'd gotten too familiar, and he was desperate to make her feel okay, about it. That's a great idea. Can we get some on the way home? Her smile returned, tentatively. Suddenly she looked shy. Sure. They stood there gazing at each other foolishly until a man Isaac didn't know asked all the kids to sit down. He welcomed them, said a short prayer, and then released them by age group. That was quick, Isaac said. Why don't they just all go to their rooms in the first place? Not sure. I think he's trying to give their volunteer teachers a few extra minutes to panic and prepare. Okay, so he just told the smalls to stay here? She laughed. Yes, they're the biggest group, so they get the sanctuary this year. This is so confusing. Why are they called the smalls if they're the biggest group? She looked at him like he was stupid. I'm just kidding. I understand. Relief fell over her face. Good grief, she was beautiful. Another woman went to the front of the sanctuary and led them in a song and a weird little dance. Most of the kids went all out with the dance, waving their arms and spinning in circles. It was a cute sight, and yet Isaac's eyes kept drifting toward Dee Dee. She was clapping and singing, being a good sport, but she wasn't doing any of the motions or dance moves. He wondered if that was because of him. She seemed like the type to be more animated, along with the kids. Would she be spinning around with the kids if he weren't there? He thought so, and he felt bad that she didn't feel comfortable spinning in front of him. If he was still working for her next time they had to do this, he would try to rectify that. And then it was Dee Dee's turn. Poise and confidence carried her to the front of the sanctuary, where she opened her thin binder and set it on a music stand, okay, who wants to learn about something super fun today? Several of the kids cheered. Were they actually expecting a super fun Bible lesson? Or did they just really like Dee Dee? Dee Dee smiled brightly as she handed a small stack of paper out to about ten kids. Isaac had been lurking near the back, near the doors, but now he crept closer to get a better look at what she was up to. Each of the pieces of paper had a single word written on it in colorful marker. She told the kids with papers to head to the front of the room. Then she told them to run around and act crazy, which they did with glee. Stop, she said. Now, you are a Bible verse, but your words are all mixed up. So you have to figure out what order they go in and then line up. She smiled at one little boy. This is going to be hard, so I'll give you a hint. 
she patted him on the head. You're the first word, so you go stand right over here. She led him to the left, parked him, and then turned to the rest of the kids. Okay, go ahead. She clapped her hands, and he wasn't sure that her excitement was an act. If it wasn't genuine, then she was one talented actress. The kids milled about, glancing down at their word every few seconds, hopelessly confused about where to go. Gently and slowly, so subtly that no one but Isaac and the girl who was moving noticed, Dee Dee guided word number two beside word number one. Good job, Lucy. Look everyone. We've got two words. A few of them couldn't read yet, so those who could were reading loudly and proudly. I know. I know. A little boy holding the word weep jumped into the line. Lucy leaned forward to read his word. Rejoice with weep, Kevin? That doesn't make any sense. His head hanging, he dragged his feet back out of line. No, no. Dee Dee scooped him up. Don't go away. Just scoot down. Okay, guys, what word makes sense after with? And then she slyly helped the word them into line. Soon she had rejoice with them that rejoice. And Isaac bit back a laugh as he watched the semicolon spin around in circles, wondering what these marks on his paper were. Dee Dee put him in his spot, and then the rest came easily, except for the last word. Even though he was the only one left, he seemed very surprised to be joining the line when she told him to. Dee Dee read the verse aloud several times, and as she did, it appeared on the screen above them. All right, everyone. Let's give them a hand. She started clapping, and the rest of the smalls joined her. All of the word kids seemed grateful to sit down except for Semicolon, who wanted to stay front and center, basking in the limelight. Dee Dee let him linger there for a while, enjoying his big moment, but then other kids were pointing at him and laughing, so she nudged him back to his seat. Dee Dee pointed at the screen above her head. You can see the same words up there. This is a verse from the Book of Romans. That's one of the books that the Apostle Paul wrote. You remember who the Apostle Paul was? She didn't wait for an answer. That's right. He was one of the very first people to teach about Jesus. So he wrote letters to churches, which taught them how to get better at following Jesus. Does that make sense? A little boy raised his hand. Yes, Michael? I have a cat named Roman. Multiple kids burst into giggles. Oh boy, this should bring out the Irish temper in her. Her eyes widened as if Michael had said something brilliant. Huh? That's so neat, Michael. Thank you for sharing. I love cats. So Paul told them that they were supposed to weep with those who weep. Michael, can you come up here for a minute? He looked a little scared, but he went up front. Thank you for your help. Can you demonstrate what it means to weep? He hesitated, looking a bit surprised at the request, but then he got into character. He put his fists to his eyes and rubbed while wailing like a cartoon baby. The peanut gallery laughed some more. As they did, Dee Dee thanked Michael and asked Mia to come to the front. Then she asked her to demonstrate rejoicing. Mia jumped up and down and waved her hands over her head. Then she screamed, go, Vikings, at the top of her lungs. Wow. If anyone walked in right now, it would look like complete chaos, like Dee Dee had zero control over these kids, but he couldn't find one face in the sea of faces that wasn't engaged. More than engaged, enthralled. Had Dee Dee Bannon missed her calling? Thank you for your help, Mia. Okay, so we are supposed to rejoice with those who rejoice. That means that if your friend wins a football game, you are happy with him. You celebrate with him. That means you don't get jealous of his victory. And Paul also says that we are to weep with those who weep. Now, Michael. Yes, he said slowly. If you are at school, and you see someone fall down at recess, what do you do? There were a few snickers. Michael did not answer. Her eyes slid to a kid near him. Anthony, what does Michael do when someone falls down? I help them up, a little girl called from the other side of the room. Good job, Madeline. Dee Dee called without taking her eyes off Anthony. What does Michael do? Uh, he laughs at them. 
Dee Dee gave Michael a dramatically disappointed look. It was so powerful that Isaac felt guilty, and it had been a long time since he'd laughed at anyone during recess. Michael looked at the toes of his winter boots. So, Michael, instead of laughing, what if you tried to feel what that kid was feeling? Let's say it was Anthony who fell down. Let's say he tried to jump off the swing, and his foot got caught, and he landed on his bum, what do you think he'd be feeling? A sore bum? Michael said. Kids laughed, but Dee Dee stayed focused. That's right. What else? Michael shrugged. Do you think he might be embarrassed? Michael nodded. So what could you do instead of laugh? Help him up, the little girl screamed. Help him up. Michael said. Good. What else? Michael shrugged again, his eyes still focused on his boots, which were now kicking the pew in front of him. See if he's okay? Good. Dee Dee cried with excitement. Good job, Michael. That's right. She finally let him off the hook and spread her attention out. God wants us to experience life together. That means all parts of life, the good and the bad. When we see someone get something good, we should be happy for them. When we see something bad happen, we should be sad with them. People don't want to do these things alone, and God doesn't want us to live that way. We weren't created to be alone. Does that make sense? The sanctuary was still and quiet. Good job, guys. Thanks for listening, let's pray. Isaac kept his eyes open, watching her pray. He was having trouble reconciling this version of Didi with the one who had called him crazy. Then he reminded himself that he didn't have to reconcile anything because he'd forgiven her for that. Now he just needed to work on forgetting it ever happened. Chapter 13 Dee Dee had volunteered to stay until all the kids were picked up, so she wandered over to her bodyguard to wait. She was a little embarrassed to have acted so silly and animated in front of him, but he'd seemed as interested in her little lesson as the kids were. I think you might have missed your calling, he said when she got close. What? I mean, I know you are a billionaire, so you don't have to work a day in your life, but… Plenty of billionaires work. She was annoyed, but she worked really hard to hide it. Maybe, but they don't have to. Anyway, would you please let me pay you a compliment? Sure. She had to look away. Staring up into his eyes was too much. You are really good at that. You would make the best teacher ever. I wish I'd had a teacher like you when I was that age. I might have paid attention once in a while. She smiled. Thank you for the compliment. I'm just young at heart, that's all. He touched her elbow, and she had to look at him. That's not all. Sure, I can accept that that's part of it, but there's more. I'm telling you, you were really good. Thank you, she said again. She didn't let it go to her head though. How much experience did Isaac have with kids? Close to zero. And how many children's ministry lessons had he observed in his lifetime? Maybe still zero. So, sorry, but I have to wait till the kids get picked up. I volunteered before I knew that I would be sporting a bodyguard tonight. He chuckled. No worries, though I am getting really excited about that pizza. Oh yeah, she'd forgotten all about their pizza date. Her belly danced with nerves. She saw him coming and flinched. Dwight Gherkin. He wasn't her favorite person, and his kids were total terrors. She braced herself for whatever criticism was about to hit her. She looked around the sanctuary, hoping for another adult who might get hit with it instead of her, but nope, she and Isaac were the only grown-ups left. I've been waiting outside for ten minutes. She opened her mouth to apologize, but he wouldn't let her. Beside her, Isaac stiffened. I watch kids pour out of this building. The parking lot is lit up like Bank Stadium, but my kids can't come outside and walk 15 feet to the car. My oldest one is 10, for crying out. Enough. Isaac's one word came out tinged with growl. Dwight looked at him, stunned that someone had talked back to him. Who are you? Oh no. It doesn't matter who I am. Men don't holler at women. Surely your mother taught you that. 
Dwight looked confused. He turned back to Dee Dee and with less wrath, continued his argument. There is no reason that I need to come inside to get my kids. It's perfectly safe for them to walk out of the building. This is South Dakota. And there are a million people around. Who do you think is going to kidnap them? I'm sorry, Dwight. The church's policy is that we don't let kids leave without a parent. You would need to talk to an elder. I'm not asking them to leave. I'm asking them to get into my car. Enough. Isaac stepped closer, and his hand was balled into a tight fist. Are you kidding me? You are complaining because you, a grown man, is being asked to get out of your car and walk that 15 feet? Really? Are you that lazy? Are you that ridiculous? Is this really the biggest problem in your life? Wow, I wish my biggest problem was this size. I would be throwing a party. Dwight was inching back as people in the foyer stuck their heads in to see what all the shouting was about. Dee Dee gently put her hands on Isaac's arm. She didn't think he was going to hit Dwight, but she wasn't willing to bet the farm on it. Hey, she said softly, let's go. Isaac looked up and scanned the room. There are still kids left. He looked at Dwight. You go. You were in such a hurry to leave, you must have really important places to be. At least his voice had returned to a normal volume, but his jaw was so tight she could bounce a quarter off it. Dwight gave her one last dirty look and then turned and stomped off. Isaac waited till he was out of sight before turning toward her. I am so, so sorry. No, no, it's okay. He smiled, but it looked forced. Are you just weeping with those who weep right now? She laughed. No. Maybe, but it's sincere. I get it. He was being completely ridiculous. He nodded. Yes, he was, but this is America, and people are allowed to be ridiculous. He took a deep breath and let it out slowly. But I am just really, really bad at controlling myself when I'm around that kind of thing. He exhaled some more. I'm sorry, Dee Dee. I know we're in church. She wrapped her arms around his waist and gave him a tight squeeze. Will you please believe me that it's okay? I don't care. You didn't harm anyone. She looked up into his eyes and realized that her face was way, way too close to his. She leaned her head back an inch, but he leaned his forward. Was he going to kiss her? Now. Here. In front of the kids? Oh boy, they would love that, seeing Miss Dee Dee get a smooch right in the sanctuary. She'd never hear the end of it. But then Isaac seemed to come to his senses. He put his hands on her arms and gently pushed them down as he stepped back. You are really something, Miss Dee Dee Bannon. But can I get a rain check on that pizza? I'm really tired all of a sudden. Chapter 14 Isaac sulked as Dee Dee drove home through the darkness. He couldn't believe that he'd lost his cool like that on some church dude, he couldn't believe he'd done it in front of Dee Dee, and he couldn't believe he'd bailed on pizza. He really wanted some pizza. He was really hungry. And there was nothing to eat in her house except absolute junk food. Not that pizza was health food, but it had to be better than the Whitey's White Tiger Paws ice cream in her freezer and the Spicy Dots pretzels in her pantry. For the first time, he wished Callum had found his backup. Then he'd be able to sneak out and get his own pizza. He tried to think of a way to get the ship back on course. What could he say that would make it cool to stop? You know what, on second thought, I am actually a little hungry. Sorry, like a child I have trouble knowing whether I'm hungry or not. Or I've calmed down now and decided I'd like to eat. Sorry, like a child's emotions, mine are sort of a roller coaster. No. Anything he would say would make him sound wishy-washy, indecisive, and weak. He would fast for the night. It was his penance for acting like an irritable nut. He shook his head. Maybe she'd been right. Maybe he was a little crazy. And then, as if an angel had whispered into her ear, Dee Dee tentatively said, I know you said you were tired, and I totally don't want to be needy or anything, but I can't stop thinking about pizza, and if I get home and order it delivery, then it will take forever and probably be cold, 
So I was wondering if you would mind if I stop and grab a few pieces from the gas station? It would only take a minute. Do you enjoy gas station pizza? Well, yeah. Pizza's pizza. Really? Why had he thought she was a snob again? Let's stop at Pizza Ranch. Yeah. He could hear the excitement in her voice. She really was a child at heart. He chuckled. Yeah. I could use some cactus bread. It had been a very long time since he'd tasted that cinnamony goodness. So much for trying to eat healthier. She surprised him by pulling a U-turn in the middle of the road. Holy smokes, going cowboy, are we? She giggled. You said cactus bread. Wanna hear something funny? Sure. My dad used to bring us here when we were little, and I would never eat the cactus bread because I assumed it would be spicy. Was that the funny part? If so, he needed to laugh, but he didn't want to laugh prematurely. That would be embarrassing. You don't think that's funny? Shoot. He'd missed his cue. No, I mean, I don't think it's not funny. Why did you think that? Because it's got the word cactus in the name. Doesn't that make you think of Texas? We have cactus. Oh, now you're just being obstinate. Her words were feisty, but her tone remained playful. No one thinks of us when they think of cactus. They think of the Southwest, of sombreros, and chili peppers, of those awful westerns my dad used to watch. Oh. I can tell you feel very strongly about this. If you'd like, I can pour some hot sauce on my dessert. She laughed. That won't be necessary. She pulled into the pizza ranch parking lot, and his stomach roared to life. Hang on a sec. He jumped out and scanned their surroundings before motioning to her to get out. See anything? She got very close to him before starting to the door. Did she not feel safe? You know, I served with a few women. She looked up at him. Trying to make me jealous? He laughed. What did that mean? Uh... No. I wanted to tell you that they taught me something. What's that? They taught me to respect a woman's sixth sense. Now, I know men can have it too, but I think God gave women an extra dose of it. Yeah. Yeah, so if you ever feel like something's off, please don't ignore it. Please tell me. It probably means something. Okay. I will. Good. He opened the door for her and gave the parking lot one last scan as they stepped inside. The hostess greeted them, and Dee Dee asked if she could place an order. When the hostess asked if was for there or to go, Dee Dee said, to go, and this disappointed Isaac more than it should have. Chapter 15 Dee Dee didn't think she had ever been so excited to go to Rapid City. It was only Rapid City, but the idea of going tux shopping with this hunk? Who had recently vowed to be nice to her? Well, she was nearly giddy. Of course, she had to hide that from Isaac. Are you ready to go, he asked. I suppose. She got up and took her coffee cup to the sink, trying to act nonchalant. Let me just grab my coat. Make it a thick one. It's cold enough to cripple your lungs out there. She stopped and looked at him, admiring his profile in the morning light. Did you miss that? He looked at her. Miss what? The cold. I imagine it was pretty hot in the desert. He chuckled. It could get a little chilly at night. And yes, though I never thought about missing the actual cold, I missed home so much that I probably did miss the cold too. He looked contemplative. I couldn't wait to get away from this place, but when I was gone, all I wanted was to come back home. She couldn't relate to that. She'd never really traveled anywhere. She never really had the urge to. You ever think about traveling for fun now? She was honored that he was considering her question so carefully. I guess I haven't really thought about it yet. I've just been so focused on getting settled in. But I'm not opposed to it. He chuckled. A few more days like this, and I might want to go to a beach somewhere. She pictured him on the beach, in the sun, in swim trunks, with sand in his hair, and her cheeks got hot. 
She turned away quickly. Sorry. I got distracted. Let me get my coat. He watched her go. She could feel his eyes on her. Was there any chance that he might actually like her? Because if so, she could be a little patient. She had a feeling that he was worth the wait. But, if there wasn't any chance, she didn't want to waste her time hoping. She bundled up and then reached for the door. Do you want to drive, or do you want me to? He was being so polite, and it seemed effortless, miraculously, she didn't annoy him anymore. She looked in the driveway. He still had one of the ranch trucks. I'd kind of like to if you don't mind. He shook his head. Not at all. He stepped outside, scanned the area, and then motioned for her to follow him out. He hadn't been kidding. The air sliced through her chest like a knife. She hurried to the car, started it, and cranked the heater even though it was blowing cold air. She turned on the seat warmers and the steering wheel warmer and then waited for relief. Once he was buckled up, she headed west. Have you been to this place before, he asked. I have. I've bought a few bridesmaid dresses there. He raised his eyebrow. Oh yeah? Is bridesmaiding a hobby of yours or another one of your community services? It struck her funny that he'd used bridesmaid as a verb. It sure felt like an action word. There was a lot of work involved. That's probably why they'd chosen the word made way back when they invented the brutal concept. Neither, and I'm starting to enjoy it less and less. She instantly felt guilty for saying that. Now who was the grumpy one? She hurried to add, there has been a flurry of weddings lately. It's a lot. She stopped talking. She knew how he got annoyed when people complained about things that weren't actually hard. I've never been in a wedding. She didn't know what to say to that. Was she supposed to offer condolences? You have a sister, right? I do. Is she married yet? He chuckled. Yet? No. I don't think she ever will be. I mean, I don't mean to say anything bad about her, but she's pretty independent. She's got two kids. She seems content with them. Dee Dee couldn't imagine raising two kids without the help of a husband and father. It's none of my business, but is the dad around? Dads, plural. She's made some mistakes. And I think they're involved. Some, anyway. But I think my sister might be hard to get along with sometimes. Are you close with her? I try to be. She's pretty good to me. And I try to be there for her kids. But it was hard while I was away. We drifted a little. Well, you're home now. Yes, thank God. His thanks sounded so sincere, as if he were actually praying. Do you get together with your family for Christmas? He hesitated, scratching his jaw. I do, but it's really not a big deal for us. He shook his head. I had a pretty weird childhood. My dad was an alcoholic, and he was. It was rough. I wasn't abused or anything, but it was a tense household, and my mom was never happy. She was always stressed out, always worried about him going to jail, about money. He chuckled dryly. Sorry, I'm oversharing. No, no, she said quickly. I asked. Sorry, I didn't mean to pry. No, you didn't pry. And I don't mean to make Christmas sound like a big depressing event. It's not. But Christmas just isn't a big deal. We get together, we have a meal, we exchange a few gifts. It's just hard for us to pretend that everything is rosy when we had so many bad Christmases together. She couldn't imagine it. The Bannon family Christmases were ridiculous, like something straight out of a Christmas card commercial. She felt a little guilty about how lavishly they treated one another. Of course, Callum always made sure that any kid in need within a hundred miles didn't go without, but still, the Bannons never lacked for anything. She couldn't imagine a different kind of Christmas, and trying to imagine it made her sad. I'm sorry that I've depressed you, he said softly. Maybe I should go back to being grumpy. She laughed lightly. No, please don't. You didn't depress me. 
I find people really interesting, so I like hearing about your life. I wish I knew you back then, but I barely remember you. This might have been an exaggeration. Did she remember him at all? He was several years ahead of her in school. She couldn't picture him back then. I don't think you would have noticed me if we were the same class. She laughed. Of course I would have. Have you forgotten how small our school is? I know, but I think I was the quietest kid in the building. Really? He wasn't loud now, but she still couldn't picture him as the quiet, shy kid. Really? You know what? I just realized something. You know how I get annoyed when people freak out over nothing? Well, I've always blamed that on my time in the service. I saw horrors. I was exposed to actual problems. But now that I'm thinking about my high school self, which I never, ever do on purpose, he chuckled. But now that I'm thinking about that kid, I realize I was like that back then too. So I guess I can't blame my lack of compassion on what I saw overseas. Well, she said softly, you'd already been exposed to hard things. Even way back then. Yeah. I guess I was. Chapter 16 The bridal shop was enormous and ridiculous. Isaac was uncomfortable the second he opened the door. How could something this pretentious exist in South Dakota? Why are the lights so bright? Then he laughed. Here he was complaining about something that wasn't actually a problem. Maybe to differentiate colors? He wasn't sure what this meant. A woman with her nose pointed at the ceiling looked him up and down and then said to Dee Dee, Do you have an appointment? According to her gold colored name tag, her name was Priscilla. Yes, we're a few minutes early. Dee Dee Bannon? Priscilla gasped. Oh my. Yes, of course. The word Bannon had given her brain a zap, in a millisecond, she'd gone from snobby to subservient. Right this way. We have a room ready for you. A room. This was all one giant room. He didn't see any other room in sight. Dee Dee saw his confusion. She means a dressing room, she whispered. Oh. He followed the two women toward the center of the well-lit warehouse, to a raised platform with a spread of closed doors. Isaac felt like he'd wandered onto the set of some highfalutin version of Let's Make a Deal. Each door was actually a mirror and was flanked by two more mirrors angled toward it. Maybe not Let's Make a Deal. Maybe it was the House of Mirrors at the Central States Fair. A plush loveseat faced their particular door, door number two. A dainty end table stood beside one armrest. On it sat a bucket of chilled champagne. At ten o'clock in the morning? Who were these people? You can put your things here if you'd like, and I would be happy to take your coats. Dee Dee handed hers over, and Isaac grudgingly followed her lead. The coats disappeared, and Dee Dee sat on the love seat. She patted the cushion beside her. Come on, relax a little. It's not so bad. He sat beside her and then nearly jumped when he saw the three reflections of himself staring back. Priscilla returned and picked up the two champagne flutes. May I pour you a glass? No, thank you, Dee Dee said. Priscilla's eyes slid to meet Isaac's. He shook his head and held up one hand. Disappointed, she set the glasses down. Very well. If you wouldn't mind standing up, sir, I will get some measurements. This was a nightmare. He looked at Dee Dee. I know what size I am. Can I just go look at the rack? Some of the twinkle left Dee Dee's eyes, and he felt guilty. She was enjoying this, and he was being a spoil sport. Never mind. He stood and braced himself. But to her credit, Priscilla was nimble and quick with her little sewing tape, and he only felt a little violated. I'll be right back. She scampered off like a stressed out squirrel. While he waited, he scanned the store to see if there was anyone else in there. He had a good vantage point from the platform. Unless someone was hiding behind one of the raised mannequins, he would be able to see him. He winced. The idea of someone hiding behind a mannequin was quite creepy, and he wished he hadn't thought of it. Priscilla was back with three suits. They all looked exactly the same. 
she hung them in the dressing room and then backed out. Come on out when you're ready, and let us take a look. Oh boy. He was going to have to model the tuxedo? Had he signed up for this? He didn't remember signing up for this. He stepped into the room and, feeling pressured, changed as quickly as possible. A bodyguard wasn't supposed to go into a closed room, leaving his charge on the other side of the door, where he couldn't see her. He stepped out, and Priscilla clapped with well-faked glee. She looked at Dee Dee. What do you think? He couldn't quite read Dee Dee's expression. She cleared her throat. It looks good. Her eyes lifted to meet his. Do you like it? Sure. Great. Priscilla said. She got too close to him and tugged on his pant leg. He had to work not to jerk away from her. Then she pulled down on his sleeve. If you choose this one, we'll have to let the sleeves out a bit. I'm choosing this one, and the sleeves are fine. He pulled his arm away from her. But you really should try on the others, just to make sure this is the best choice. No, no. It's good. Isaac didn't want to close that door between them any more than he had to. Priscilla was disappointed. All right. Let me go find your accessories and shoes. He didn't know what she meant by accessories, but he said, I have shoes. She obviously didn't believe him, but she walked away. Dee Dee looked at his head. Are you going to wear a hat to the gala? He hadn't given it much thought. I suppose that's up to you. She smiled playfully. No, it's up to you. I guess I don't have to. I don't want to embarrass you. Oh, no, no, she said quickly. This is South Dakota. Some of the men wear them. Not many, but some. Does Callum go to this thing? He's gone before, but he tries to avoid it. Does he wear his hat? She narrowed her eyes. What do you think? With the hat question still unanswered, Priscilla returned with a tray of hideous bow ties. Pink? Did men really wear pink bow ties? In South Dakota? There were two purple ones, and one with both pink and purple flowers on it. His eyes flitted to Dee Dee. I have a black tie at home. Can I wear? A necktie? Priscilla cried in horror. Then she cackled. You're not taking her to the high school prom, are you? Nope, he sure wasn't. Dee Dee stood and came to look at the offerings. Oh yeah, none of those look like you, do they? No, they certainly did not. Not even this one? Priscilla held up an ugly blue one. This one has ocean waves. We're in South Dakota, Isaac said. Dee Dee put a hand on his arm and smiled at Priscilla. Do you have any others? Oh, of course. I'll go get some. In the meantime, would you like to choose your pocket square? Magically, the tray separated into two trays, and then it was one again, now displaying an assortment of pastel hankies. Once again, the absurd pink jumped out at him. I'm not sure I need a pocket square. Priscilla's gasp involved her whole body this time, and she bobbled the fancy tray, almost spilling hankies everywhere. When she'd gotten control, she looked at him. You can't not have a pocket square. Fine. At this point, he would agree to just about anything if it meant he could leave this store. I'll take that one. He pointed to a white one. Good choice. But when she handed it to him, it was so dainty he almost couldn't deal. Was that silk? Priscilla left, and he looked at Dee Dee, his new hanky in his hand. He wasn't quite sure what to do with it. Do men really carry around silk hankies in their tuxes? She giggled. Didn't you ever go to prom? I did not. She leaned into him, bumping him playfully. You might not believe it, but you look incredibly handsome and incredibly masculine. As she spoke, she folded the hanky and put it into his pocket. Her touching his chest felt better than it should have, and he tried not to think about it. Good choice on the white, by the way. It's classy. As classy as the hot pink? He raised an eyebrow. She giggled. Just pick a bow tie. You don't have to wear it. 
Good. She was ready to get out of this place too. I can go Tylus? Her smile faded a little. Maybe not Tylus. Can I wear a B-O-L-O tie? She patted his chest again. Sure. You would look amazing. This praise tried to go to his head, and he tried to stop it. She was just being nice. No way would she think that he looked handsome or amazing if they weren't stuck together in this circumstance. Thinking of their circumstances made him pull his eyes away from hers and scan the room again. It was still empty. How do these people stay in business? She looked at his chest pointedly. That hanky of yours costs a hundred dollars. You don't have to sell many of those to. What, he cried, ripping it out of his pocket. Didi, how much is this suit? Don't worry about it. It's for charity. Did she know how charity worked? Giving money to this store so he could wear an expensive monkey suit did not help people in need. She leaned in and whispered, I'm sorry that you're uncomfortable, but I really appreciate you putting up with it. I won't do it to you again for at least a year. As she spoke, she returned his hanky to its proper place. Then she turned to greet Priscilla, who was returning with her magic tray. Isaac was speechless. For at least a year? Did she really think that they'd even know each other in a year? Chapter 17 Please say we can stop for lunch, Dee Dee said. She hadn't given her stomach anything but coffee, and it was quite angry with her. Of course we can, but can we not go to a place with million dollar, he paused. Oh no. I was trying to be funny, and now I can't even remember what it's called. Give me a clue. Salty fish eggs. She giggled. Caviar? He snapped his fingers. Yes. That's it. No caviar, please. She grimaced. No problem. First, I don't think there's a place in Rapid that serves it, and second, it wouldn't even occur to me to order it. No? Not a fan? I've never had it, but no, I am pretty confident that it would make me ill. He laughed heartily. He was acting so relaxed around her now. He was a whole different man. The trouble was, she liked this one even more. I have eaten it, and yeah, I can't imagine why it's considered such a treat. Rich people are weird. She tried not to take offense. How about Billy's? I thought you didn't like steak. Just because it's a steakhouse doesn't mean that they only serve steak. I know that. She looked at him quickly. Had she accidentally offended him again? Good grief, the man sure was sensitive for a marine. And I don't dislike steak. I've just eaten a lot of it in my life. So, do you want to go there? Sure, on one condition. What's that? I know it's absurd to say this to a billionaire, but please let me buy. My pride sort of depends on it. She laughed. Sure. I'd be honored. The gesture felt romantic. She knew he hadn't meant it that way, but still, she let herself enjoy the feeling. Billy's was packed, so they had to wait in the lobby for a seat. To avoid the personal space of the other hungry people waiting, she stood extra close to Isaac. It was awfully tempting to pretend she was on a date. Maybe when this was all over, Callum could keep paying Isaac to be her boyfriend. What? Isaac was looking at her with suspicion. What? I didn't say anything. No, but you were smiling like you were thinking of something funny. Oh, sorry. Sometimes I tell myself jokes. Really? He cocked an eyebrow. Care to share? Sorry. She waved her hand. I've already forgotten it. Well, next time, I'd love to hear it. I like jokes. He did? She'd seen no evidence of that. Before she could think of a good joke to share, the hostess was waving them over. She led them to a cozy table beside the fireplace. Oh great, even more date-like. Isaac rubbed the side of his neck that was close to the fire. His skin was a little red. Is it too warm? It took him a second to realize what she meant. Oh, no. That actually feels good. 
I fell asleep in the chair last night, and my neck was at a bad angle. She really wanted to jump up and go massage that kink out for him, but she wasn't sure that would be appropriate. You really don't need to sleep in the chair. He smiled. I didn't mean to. And I didn't, for long. I don't think he's going to come after me at night, and you said you were a light sleeper. I bet we'd be okay, if you slept in an actual bed. You'd hear him if he tried anything. She had a thought she didn't like. Maybe I should install some alarms. We can do that if it would make you feel safer. I can't believe Callum can't find anyone to help you. She didn't want anyone to help Isaac, so she was secretly glad Callum was struggling. Yeah, the company he works with is short-staffed, I guess. They keep telling him that they'll send someone as soon as they can, but... I don't think we need someone else. There, she'd finally said it. Do you really think he's going to try something? I mean, he still has to go to court for the last time. He doesn't even know what his punishment is for that one yet. Maybe he's done with me. How long has it been since he's done something through social media? She didn't want to answer that, but she couldn't think of a way to dodge the question. I haven't checked lately. He looked at her purse. Check right now. She almost groaned. She didn't want to be looking at her phone right now. She wanted to be looking at the man across the table from her, the one with the cowboy hat and the red neck. She pulled her phone out of her purse. I deleted all the apps. That's a problem, Dee Dee. His voice had grown serious. You shouldn't have to change the way you live your life because of him. It's okay. They say social media is bad for you anyway. He didn't smile. I'm serious. Put the apps back on your phone, please. She nodded. Okay. I will. She'd missed Instagram, so she did that one first. Isaac didn't say anything as she reloaded her phone with all the chaos. She paused to order her food and then finished logging into the last two apps. Then she set the phone down, bracing herself for all the notifications to blow up. There. Done. Good. Thank you. You never answered my question, she said. What was your question? She asked him again if he thought that Milton was a threat. She still couldn't believe the man's name was actually Milton. Who names their kid Milton? I don't know. It would be tempting to think that he's backed off, but I think there's a good chance he's dealing with some mental illness. He gave her a cryptic look. So I'm not sure we should be making any assumptions. Nothing he's done has made any sense yet. Why would he start making sense now? Chapter 18 By Saturday afternoon, they still had seen no sign of Milton, and Dee Dee was being awfully tight-lipped about where they were going for the afternoon. The gala was that night, and Isaac was nervous. He didn't understand why she was trying to squeeze any errand in, mere hours before the gala. Didn't most women spend all day on hair and nails before an event like that? She'd mentioned going without him, saying that Milton must have given up by now, but Isaac was not about to let that happen, not without Callum's say-so, and maybe not even with it. And now, mere minutes before she'd said they had to leave, she was acting all sheepish. Was Dee Dee Bannon embarrassed about something? You know, you really need to tell me where we're going. What's the difference if I know now or when we get there? She sighed. You're right. I need to tell you because I need to get ready. She stopped talking. Okay, then, tell me. She bit her lip. But I really, really don't want you to be mean about it. Mean, he cried. When had he ever been anything approaching mean with Dee Dee? Especially since they'd had their chat about his grumpiness. Yes, mean. I know what you're going to think and I don't want to hear it. And you have to promise not to tell my brothers. Finn would never let me hear the end of it. Uh. I haven't talked to Finn in, well, ever, I don't think. She chuckled. Fine. Well, okay. Spit it out, he said playfully. He couldn't bear watching her squirm. He reached out and touched her hand. Just a small touch. Nothing invasive. Just a little comfort. 
Hey, really, whatever it is, it's okay. She looked at him and then dramatically tipped her head back and looked at the ceiling instead. Okay, so like there are kids in town who have birthday parties, and they can't afford entertainment, so like a few years ago, I started. Um. You started what? Entertainment. If she hadn't said the word kids, he might have been more nervous. What kind of entertainment? It'll be easier if I just show you. Wait here. She nearly ran out of the room. He waited. And waited. He got sick of waiting and made a lap around the house. Then he came back in to find her still in her bedroom with the door shut. Are you okay, in there? Yep. Be right out. He doubted that. He looked at the time. Wherever they were going, they were going to be late. He paced in the living room for another full minute before she called, Okay, I'm coming out. And I'm telling you, don't be mean. Uh. Okay. The door opened slowly, and he didn't know whether to laugh or scream. Beautiful Dee Dee Bannon's sun-kissed skin was painted ghost white except for the giant lipstick red lips painted around her mouth. Her hair had been replaced by a round bush of a rainbow, the colors of which were so bright they hurt his eyes. I told you not to be mean. I. I, his tongue was one thick, wordless knot. He tried to look away, but he couldn't. Her eyes bore out at him from behind thick black outlines and giant blue triangles above and below. Completing the ridiculous makeup was a perfectly round red dot on each cheek. A strong urge to kiss one of those dots startled him into speech. You're a clown. Her expression relaxed. At least, he thought it did. It was hard to tell under all that paint. In an unexpected turn of events, she was the one now wearing a tux, a glaring ensemble of tomato red, banana yellow, leaf green, and royal blue. Her lapel and her bow tie were a garish plaid of all these colors and more, and her very baggy pants sported the same plaid pattern. Couldn't you find pants that fit, he cried as if that were the most offensive detail before him. She wordlessly opened her jacket to show him striped suspenders holding her breeches up. She let the jacket fall shut. Come on. We're late. In a daze, he followed her to her car. She slid her feet, which were wearing normal white socks into her winter boots, and he was relieved she wasn't going to wear the big floppy red shoes, but then she grabbed a giant duffel bag, and he knew he wasn't out of the woods yet. Do you want me to drive? He wondered if it might be hard for her to see past all that makeup. Sure. She sounded sad, and he became desperate to comfort her. He didn't get a chance until they were in the truck. I'm sorry, Dee Dee. You just surprised me. You really do look cute, and this is such a nice thing that you're doing. When you said entertain, I thought you meant sing or dance or something. She laughed as if this were the preposterous option. I can't sing. How was she ever going to get her skin back to normal before the gala? She gave him directions to the house, which was outside of town. That must be it. A small bundle of balloons were trying to float up from the mailbox, but it was so cold out that they were drooping. She got out of the truck and deftly swapped her winter boots out for her clown shoes, which were every bit as hideous as he'd feared. She started toward the house, slipped, and almost went down, but he caught her. Even underneath all this costume, she still smelled good. Are you all right? He got her back onto her giant feet. Yep. Right as rain. She tromped into the house, and the small gaggle of children burst into applause. Instantly, Dee Dee transformed. She was the entertainer again. Who wants a happy balloon, she cried and pulled from a hidden pocket a handful of balloons, one of which she started to blow up, but it popped in her hands, and she let out an exaggerated screech and danced around like she were holding a live firecracker. She'd done that on purpose. A trick balloon? She waddled toward the front of the room. Sit down, sit down, and I'll tell you a story. She motioned to the floor by her feet, and the kids, ranging in age from one to about ten, happily obeyed. Chapter 19 Dee Dee could feel Isaac's eyes on her, and she'd never felt so self-conscious in her life. What was wrong with her? She never felt like this. She never worried about what people thought, 
and she sure wouldn't care if someone were to criticize her for doing something so good and pure, but this was different. She really cared what Isaac thought, and she really wanted to cut that out. Okay, who wants to see my magic rope? They all cheered. She tried to focus on them and ignore the open-mouthed bodyguard still standing by the door. She pulled the rope out of a pocket and waved it around so that it looked like an ordinary rope. Then she burbled a bunch of gibberish in a commanding voice, and the rope stood on end. The kids gasped, just like they were supposed to. She handed it over to a cute little guy up front, and when he took it from her, it collapsed back into a rope. Everyone clapped, even Isaac. She let herself glance at him and was a bit comforted by what she saw. His mouth had finally closed, and he was smiling. She smiled back and went on to her next trick. When the illusion portion of her short show was complete, she slid into her jokes. She only had three, and she used them at every party, even when there were repeat guests. She'd been meaning to find some new jokes, but she only thought about it when she was actively being a clown. Now she really wished she'd found those new jokes because if Isaac truly did like jokes, he might be insulted by these. She took a deep breath. Okay, kiddos. What do you call a dancing cow? They all stared at her with bated breath. She didn't make them suffer long. A milkshake, she said and swung her hips around in a circle. She glanced at Isaac and was encouraged to see a chuckle. And what did the snowman have for breakfast? Frosted flakes. She faked a loud laugh and couldn't bear to look at Isaac. Okay, you want one more? More. More, they chanted. Okay. One more. But we've got to be really quiet for this one, okay? She leaned toward them, and most of them leaned toward her as well. She held a finger up to her lips and said, Shh. Their eyes were huge. Okay, she whispered. What do you call a sleeping bull? A few of them shook their heads. None of them took a stab at it. She stood up straight and cried, a bulldozer. As they laughed in that beautiful way that children with free spirits can laugh, she rested for a few seconds, so grateful that the joke portion of her show was over. She sneaked a peek at Isaac, and he was smiling widely and slowly clapping his big hands together. She returned the smile and then immediately got back to work, inviting one of the girls to dance. The girl jumped up, and Dee Dee helped her climb onto the top of her ridiculous shoes. Then she danced with her in big sweeping movements. Of course all the kids jumped up then. I want a turn. I want to try. So she let each of them have a turn, and then the show was over. She glanced at the clock. She was going to have to hustle if she was going to get to the gala anywhere near close to start time. She threw her nose into the small but rowdy crowd, as she always did, and then she took an exaggerated bow, careful not to let her wig fall off. This had happened a few times, and the kids had wanted to keep that too. She'd let them, of course, but the wigs were harder to come by than the noses, so she wanted to hold on to this one. She pointed the kids toward the cake, and they happily lost interest in her in the name of sugar. She politely excused herself to the host, explaining that she had somewhere to be. The mom tried to give her money, but Dee Dee refused. Really, it's my pleasure. The mom lowered her voice. Quite a handsome friend you've got there. He's a good sport to go with you on these adventures. Oh yes. He's a good sport. She smiled and goodbyed her way out the door and then she was changing back into her boots. It was really cold in the truck, and she shivered. He turned the heat on high. That was pretty spectacular. Oh, be quiet. No, I'm serious. He was staring at her, so she met his eyes. For real, Dee Dee. I'm so impressed. I'm so impressed that you would be willing to do that to make kids happy, and I'm even more impressed by how good at it you are. She tried not to beam under his praise. Maybe she'd been worried for nothing. It didn't seem he was going to give her any flack. But I can see why you don't want me to tell Finn. She laughed. Right? Too bad. I don't know the guy, of course, but from what I've heard, he'd probably make a pretty good clown. I tried to get him to go to clown school with me, but he. You went to clown school? 
Of course. How did you think I learned all that? He shrugged. I don't know, YouTube? Well, it wasn't a real clown school. It was more like a night class that I took. Do you do rodeos too? She thought he was kidding, but she wasn't a hundred percent sure. Uh... No. I'm way too much of a wuss for that. She laughed. I just do it for the kids. You're quite something, Dee Dee Bannon. Not at all what I expected. No? What did you expect? He hesitated. It doesn't matter now. Let's just say that I'm happy to know the real you. Chapter 20 When Dee Dee stepped out of her bedroom, Isaac gasped for the second time that day. How could this possibly be the same person who'd been wearing clown shoes a few hours ago? She wore a floor-length red velvet dress that made her skin look like copper. The neckline left one shoulder bare, and it looked so delicate there in the soft light that it made him think of butterflies. A modest slit traveled up one leg, and her high heels kept her dress from touching the floor. Her black hair fell in loose curls around her shoulders. How did you have time to curl your hair? She giggled. I'll never tell. Then she changed her mind. I had curlers on under the wig. He shook his head. Beautiful and brilliant. She looked him up and down. You don't look so bad yourself. Nice B.O.L.O. tie. He grinned, feeling a bit self-conscious. Thanks. He couldn't wait for this evening to be over and to get back out of this monkey suit, but he wasn't going to tell her that. She pulled a long black coat from her closet, and he helped her into it. She thanked him and then asked if he had a coat. He grabbed his car heart. Sure do. Too late, he worried that this would irritate her, but she only giggled. Don't worry, he reassured her, I won't wear it into the event. Oh, I don't care either way. She might not care, but he did. He would rather eat rocks than embarrass her. He walked her out to the truck, still keeping an eye out for anything or anyone evil, but the coast was clear. Which hotel is it again? She told him and rattled off the address, though he didn't need it yet. It was still a long drive to Rapid City. As much time as you spend in Rapid, you should probably live there. I've thought about it. But it's too far from my family. Besides, I like West Hope. It's home. Of course she liked West Hope. West Hope liked her. She was the town's darling. How had he gotten so lucky to be spending so much time with her? You know, I wonder if you still need me. She snapped her face toward him. She hadn't been expecting that. Callum told me that under the circumstances, he told his security firm to keep their guy. I wonder if soon he'll dismiss me too. I'll have something to say about that. Until Milton is in jail, I want you. He tried not to linger on those final words. I mean, if that's okay, with you. She laughed uncomfortably. I don't want you against your will. I'm happy to help for as long as you need me. This was the best paying job he'd ever had, and the scenery was breathtaking. Good. Thank you. And it might be longer than you think, so if you change your mind, please let me know. I won't like it, but I can deal with it. I know it can get pretty boring following me around. He didn't bother correcting her. Why would it take longer than I think? She sighed. I don't know if it's true, but I heard a rumor that he's taking a plea deal. A rumor? From who? How had she heard a rumor without him knowing about it? Unless someone had texted her or emailed her, she hadn't had a conversation with anyone else in days. Sophie. The one who set you up with Milton in the first place. She groaned. Yeah, but I've forgiven her for that, so let's try to put it behind us. Did you ever find out why she set you up with him? Why would she do that if she didn't even know enough about him to know his real name? Dee Dee quirked an eyebrow. What, did you want her to run a background check? Isaac thought about it. Yeah. I think that's reasonable. Dee Dee giggled. Yeah, so she didn't admit this till it was far too late, but he reached out to her online, convinced her that he'd met us both at a bar a long time ago, and that he really wanted to see me again. 
he asked for her help. And because he was a hero firefighter, she laughed sardonically. She thought I would like him, which I might have, if he had actually been a hero firefighter. Now he felt bad for making her go down memory road. And he didn't much like hearing how much she'd like to date a firefighter. So what did you hear about a plea deal? Apparently, the deal is that he stays away from me, does some community service, and pays a fine. And that's it? I guess so. That doesn't seem right. He tried to snatch her for crying out loud. Or at least drag her closer to the vegetables. Like I said, I don't know if it's true. I meant to ask Callum to look into it, but I've been so busy. You have had a full day. I don't know how you're not exhausted. Are you exhausted? Yes, but I'm always exhausted. He'd said it without thinking. It wasn't a big deal. It was just the way it was. It had been like that for years. But now she was studying him in the darkness, and he wished he hadn't said it. Why are they having an event like this in this weather? Don't they know that summer comes eventually? It's a Christmas gala, and it will be too hot in the summer just like it's too cold now. And stop trying to distract me. It's not good that you're always exhausted, Isaac. Do you want me to ask Callum to go back to finding you some help? No, no, he said quickly. It's not your fault that I'm tired. It's just, it's hard for me to sleep. Are you an insomniac? Something like that. The truth was, he didn't know what he was. He'd just gotten so used to running on little sleep that he kept doing it. Well, when this is all over, we're going to work on that. She gasped. You know what we should do? Oh boy. Whatever it was, she was excited. What? We should go somewhere warm. Not tell anyone where we're going, and then Milton could never find out, and you could have a chance to relax. He didn't know what to say to that. What was she talking about? Just the two of them running off together? Why was this starting to feel like something other than a bodyguard client relationship? I'm serious. Where do you want to go? You've been all over the world, right? What spot is beautiful and safe in January? I don't know, Mexico? He really liked Mexican food. Let's go to Thailand. He laughed. I'm so glad you asked. Well, we don't have to decide right now, but I would like to do that if you're up for it. I can sit on the beach and read for days and not get bored. And you can just rest and relax. I mean, have you really relaxed since you got out of the service? No, ma'am. Then it's settled. This amused him. It was settled, and he hadn't agreed to it yet. She talked about her many reasons for wanting to visit Thailand for the rest of the drive. He listened, amused, and wondered if this was really going to happen. And he wasn't even sure whether he was rooting for it to happen. They made it to the city limits at the exact start time of the event. So they would only be a little late. Not bad for a woman leading a double life as a clown. When Isaac saw the hotel parking lot, his stomach somersaulted. There were a lot of people here. Way more than he expected. Not only was he going to be uncomfortable, but it was going to be difficult to keep her safe in a crowd like this. Chapter 21 Dee Dee could tell that Isaac was uncomfortable, so she tucked one arm under his as they weaved through the hallways to the ballroom. She was surprised to see there was security at the door and wondered if Callum had done something to encourage that. She gave the man her name and then narrowed her eyes. Did my brother hire you? He frowned. No, ma'am. There are lots of important people here tonight who don't want to be harassed by reporters and such. Oh. She felt silly and hurried inside. Not everything is about you, Dee Dee, not even in little old Rapid City. Isaac stopped walking as soon as they entered. She was confused at first but then realized he was surveying the place. Seconds later, he got going again, gently guiding her toward the edge of the room, even though it meant they'd have to walk farther. It was a good question, he said quietly. I'm betting Callum did have something to do with it. Maybe not. Seems like he would have said something to you. He did. He did. 
Why didn't you tell me? She didn't like the idea of Isaac keeping secrets from her. He didn't say he hired them, only that they would be here, but the fact that he knew about them made me think he might have helped pay for them. Anyway, what are we raising money for again here? The Black Hills Charity Cooperative. That sounds like a made-up name. She giggled. It's not. So they help connect donors to organizations, and they also do some charity work themselves. I don't know that they raise much money from the sale of these tickets. I mean look at this place. And they've got to pay for the band and the food. And some of these people don't have to buy a seat because they're running the organizations. Anyway, it's more like. I think this event is an incentive. Anyone who wants to be seen as a good person wants to get invited to this. So they give throughout the year so that they get invited. But don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, right? Pretty hard to get noticed if you're being humble with your charity. His thoughtfulness impressed her. Not everyone's charity is motivated by God. Some people do it for the tax break, and like I said, some do it for the glory it brings them. I don't even care. I'm just glad this many people are being generous, no matter what their motives are. A lot of people need help. Okay, I guess that's a good point. We're at table number three. She pointed and then started tugging him that way. His head was on a swivel the entire trip around the ballroom, and when they reached their table, he shuffled the place cards so that he would have his back to a wall. She watched him, amused. What? I haven't had assigned seating since high school. She raised an eyebrow. Really? No assigned seating in the Marines? That's different. And we rarely Saturday. He looked at the chairs and then scanned the room again. Do you want to sit or go mingle? She could tell he wanted to sit, so she lied and said that she did too. He pulled her chair out for her, and she tucked her dress in and sat. Though she had been excited to move around the room, it did feel good to get off her feet. Her new shoes were already causing her pain. She envied Isaac and his cowboy boots. A server approached and offered them wine. They both declined, and she drank half her water instead. They'd been the first to sit, and they started a trend. Soon the tables were filling up. When a chairperson of the local chapter of Help and Hope for Veterans sat down, Isaac leaned over and whispered, Did you set this up? She couldn't tell whether he thought the seating arrangement was a good one or an annoying one. She was quick to tell him that no, it was a coincidence. And they were well into their meal before anyone else figured out that Isaac was a veteran. One of the local philanthropists at the table smiled sweetly at Isaac and said, I heard you were in the service? What branch? Marines, ma'am. Wow. A Marine. How impressive. Thank you for your service. You're welcome. Isaac had looked uncomfortable for the entire evening, but now even more so. Dee Dee wanted to rescue him, but she didn't know how. The band had started playing softly, but there was no one on the dance floor yet. And they hadn't been served dessert. As excited as she was to dance, she didn't want to be a weirdo about it. The woman asked a few more questions of Isaac, and he gave her very short answers. He wasn't rude, but it was clear that he didn't really want to talk about it. Finally, the dessert arrived, and Dee Dee talked very loudly about how beautiful it was and then about how delicious it was, even though it wasn't anything special. The meal had been terrific, but the gingerbread cheesecake made her long for her ma's plain old-fashioned gingerbread. All of her blabbering worked. The woman got distracted and stopped interrogating Isaac. Isaac gave Dee Dee a small smile, and she didn't really know what it meant. She thought maybe it was a thank you. As soon as Isaac put his fork down, Dee Dee grabbed his arm. Come on, let's dance. She expected him to protest, but he didn't. He held up one hand to slow her roll, took a long drink of his water, and then stood to join her. She was tickled. She'd been afraid that she would have to beg. And she'd been a little afraid that he wouldn't dance with her at all. Not that there weren't other men there who would do her the honor, but she really wanted to dance with Isaac. He surprised her by taking her hand into his. Then he glanced down at her feet. Are you sure you want to wear those? Good point. 
How had he known her feet hurt? She had no idea, but he was right. She looked around for a discreet spot to leave her shoes, but Isaac and she were already so far from their table. I'll be okay. Suit yourself. He whipped her out onto the floor with his left arm and then caught her with his right, completely taking her breath away. She let out a surprised little laugh, but she couldn't quite manage an actual word. Instead, she said, whoa, and then felt bad because it sounded like she was talking to a horse. Where'd you learn to dance, cowboy? He laughed. I'm not a cowboy. Not really. I just wear the hat so I'll fit in. She tipped her head back and laughed. She couldn't imagine him doing anything to fit in. And to fit in with whom? He pressed his hand into her bare back, sending a shiver up and down her spine. Okay, maybe this wasn't as good of an idea as she'd thought. Yes, she'd wanted to dance with the hunk, but it probably wasn't a good idea to fall in love with him. That was a good way to get her heart broken. Dee Dee had never had her heart broken. When it came to men, she'd always been so picky that she'd never fallen far enough to get hurt. She wasn't sure that would be the case with this one. Her high standards did not disqualify Isaac Bishop. Are you doing okay? he asked. She looked up into his eyes and then looked away immediately. With the heels on, she was almost as tall as he was, which brought her perilously close to his eyes and his lips. Oh yes, I'm fine. You're awfully quiet. You know, for you. She giggled. I'm just enjoying the moment. She gasped. She hadn't meant to say moment. She'd meant to say music. Why, oh why had she said moment? Now he was going to think she was all gaga for him. Of course, he'd be right, but still, she didn't want him knowing the true state of things. Good. I was worried that your feet were making it hard to enjoy. He was worried about her enjoying the moment? She took a breath. She did not like being this flustered. I'm sorry if the chairwoman made you feel uncomfortable. She was desperate to steer the conversation in a new direction. What made you think I was uncomfortable? Oh, I don't know, because I could feel discomfort radiating off you? Sort of like how you know that my feet hurt. I don't know. I got the impression you don't really like talking about your time in the service. I don't mind talking about it. You don't? She looked at him. Then why don't you talk about it more? He gave her a cryptic smile, and his eyes melted another layer of her heart. You never asked. Really? The word came out too high-pitched. You don't mind? He spun her around, and once again, breathing became tricky. I don't mind. Okay, then. I'm going to ask. Ask away. She laughed. Well I can't think of a question right now. There's too much pressure. But I would love to hear about it sometime. Sometime when I can think about something other than your warm hand on my skin. Deal. He moved his fingers a fraction of an inch, sending another series of shivers through her back. I don't love talking about myself to strangers. I don't love small talk. But I wouldn't mind talking to you about it sometime. Some of it's pretty ugly, but we don't have to hang out in the mud. Some parts of it were beautiful. He spun her again. Let's talk about the beautiful parts then. Yes, let's. He was staring into her eyes so intently now that she couldn't pry her eyes away. The song gave way to a slower ballad, and he pulled her in tighter. What is happening? Why is he looking at me like this? Do you dance with all the women like this, because if so, I'm not sure why there's not a mob of spurned dancers following you around the country. How are your feet doing for real? She laughed. They were absolutely killing her. She could feel blisters forming and breaking. They're fine. She leaned into him. She didn't want to stop no matter how much her feet hurt. I like this song. I've never heard this song. She hadn't either, but she really, really liked it. She laid the side of her head on his shoulder and breathed him in. And that's when she knew. It was too late to stay perched on the lip of the cliff. She was already falling for Isaac. 
And with this realization came a gut-wrenching question, now what? What was she going to do with these feelings? He was no longer just the handsome stranger or the handsome employee. Now he was just Isaac, a man, a great man, a man she wanted to spend as much time as possible with, maybe a man she wanted to spend the rest of her life with. The song ended, and she slowly tilted her face up to meet his. No matter what the consequences might be, she was going to kiss this man. Right now. And it was going to be worth it. He looked down into her eyes with his deep wells, and he didn't pull away. She closed her eyes and reached for him. The contact felt like a feather on her lips. She pushed her sore feet up onto her tiptoes to go for the gold, and a loud boom blew up the moment. Before she knew what was happening, Isaac had picked her up off her feet, spun her around, and then laid her on the floor. Her body had moved so fast, and so utterly without control, that it felt like she'd been thrown, but the whole motion was fluid and gentle. She hit the floor, but it didn't hurt, and then he was on top of her, but she couldn't feel his weight. Somehow, his body covered hers, but he was holding himself up off her. She was completely ensconced in Isaac's body, a cocoon of safety. Deirdre Bannon, a familiar voice yelled. You will not cheat on me. Sickness washed over her as she realized that whatever was happening, it was her fault. Her crazy stalker had infiltrated this wonderful event that celebrated everything good. And what had that noise been? Had that been a gunshot? She knew what a gun sounded like, but she didn't know the last time she'd heard one inside, and so she wasn't sure. Or maybe she was just in denial. That had been a gunshot, hadn't it? That lunatic had brought a gun? Is everyone okay? She tried to ask Isaac, but she didn't think he'd heard her. He was looking toward the far side of the room where there was shouting and sounds of a scuffle. She picked her head up to peek past Isaac's shoulder, but she couldn't see anything. Are you okay? He started to pick himself up. Yeah, yeah, I'm good. Thank you. She sat up and tried to locate Milton, but all she saw was the cluster of men dressed in black. Milton must be in the middle of them. Good. Then he was really going to jail now. He'd gone way too far this time. She got to her feet, kicked off her shoes, and started that way. Wait. Isaac grabbed for her arm. She thought he was going to stop her, but he didn't. He simply got in front of her. That's how he was the first to see the bad news. He got away. Isaac cried, incredulous. Which way did he go? The men in black pointed in two different directions. How could you let him get away? He had a gun, one of them said. Isaac looked at her, and then looked at the door, torn. You don't have to go after him, she said. That's not your job. And it's not safe. I know that, he said, his jaw tight. But I want this to be over. She knew what he meant, but he looked at her and said, I mean, not this, but. I want him to be done threatening you. Yeah, I want that too. She grabbed his arm and leaned into him. It was a forward move, but in that moment, she didn't have the energy to hold back. Gunfire had a way of shooing inhibitions elsewhere. Okay, I'm not going after him, but it's not because I don't want to. He looked down at her and pulled his arm out of her grasp, which made her sad, but then he wrapped it around her and pulled her in tight. My job is to protect you, so I'm going to stay where you are. A woman lying on the floor nearby suddenly sat up and screamed bloody murder. Holy delayed reaction, Dee Dee muttered. I think she fainted. He said this without judgment. The woman looked left, right, and left again so fast that her hair slapped her in the face. Did he shoot someone? Who got shot? Isaac looked at the men dressed in black. Which direction did he shoot? They each looked in different directions. You don't know who he was shooting at? Isaac said. Had he been shooting at anyone? Maybe he just shot up in the air to scare people. She looked up at the ceiling, but she didn't see any damage. Calmly, Isaac said, maybe you guys should spread out and look for him. He had a gun, the man said again. Dee Dee tugged him away from the men in black. You're pretty good at this. Maybe you should go into security for real. 
No, he said passionately. The more I think about it, the more I want to work with cattle or horses for the rest of my life. Heck, I'd even take alpacas at this point. I thought you said you weren't a cowboy. An image of him trying to ride an alpaca almost made her laugh out loud. Well if Liam can't teach me, I'm betting his new wife can. Yes, yes, I bet she could. They heard sirens then. What a mess, Isaac said. We should probably get you home. What she wanted was to keep dancing, but since the band was packing up, she relented. Okay. Anger welled up inside of her. Milton had managed to ruin the evening for everyone. She wished people would stay, keep dancing, pretend nothing had happened, but she knew that wasn't rational, not while he was still out there somewhere with a gun. Do you want to go to your house or the ranch? Isaac asked. If you don't mind, I'll go to the ranch. I'm having a hankering for Ma's gingerbread. He laughed. That's pretty random. Let's go get your shoes, and then we'll find your coat. She was willing to leave the shoes behind, but that would probably earn her a rich brat point, so she didn't argue. As she buckled the medieval torture devices back onto her feet, he asked her, why did he call you Deirdre? Because that's my name. He chuckled. I know that. But why did he call you that? Does anyone call you that? Honestly, I have no idea. And no, only Ma calls me that once in a blue moon. And sometimes Finn when I call him Finnegan. His name is Finnegan? She laughed. Yes. My parents took their heritage pretty seriously. Do you like being called Deirdre? I did before it became my stalker's pet name for me. I don't think it counts as a pet name if it's on your birth certificate. Fair enough. She got her coat buttoned up and started toward the entrance. He put his arm around her protectively and kissed her on the top of the head, which sent a shiver down her neck. I think we might have a problem, Deirdre Bannon. She liked it a lot better when he said it. Oh yeah, what's that? I like you. Even though he'd certainly been acting like a man who liked a woman, his confession still caught her off guard. I like you too. Not sure why that's a problem. Well, for starters, I'm your employee. Okay, then, let's ask Callum to hire a PI to catch this guy so you can stop being my employee and start being my boyfriend. Isaac abruptly stopped walking and turned to look at her. That's brilliant. Why didn't I think of that? What? Of being my boyfriend? It had never crossed his mind? No, no, not that. The PI thing. That's brilliant. Let's go talk to Callum right now. Okay, but first we've got an hour drive back to the ranch. He was walking faster now. Aren't you rich people supposed to have private planes? Don't be ridiculous, she scoffed. Chapter 22 Isaac wasn't nearly as excited about this PI idea as he was letting on, but they were still a long drive from the ranch, and he didn't want the conversation to drift back to the possibility of something happening between Dee Dee and him. Because that was absolutely ridiculous. Now that he had calmed down, he couldn't believe he'd let things get that out of control. Sure, she might think that she likes him now, but that was only because of their predicament. He was protecting her. He made her feel safe. And he was the only man she'd spent any time with in weeks. So of course she thought she liked him, but she didn't, not really. She wouldn't, not when things returned to normal. She'd be bored out of her skull. She was Dee Dee Bannon, for crying out loud. And he was just Isaac Bishop. What did he have to offer her? A tiny bit of money in savings that he would soon spend on a modest house. Not very impressive. Do you know of any PIs in the area? Why would I know that, she said snippily. She tried to bring up their relationship several times now, and he kept babbling about the PI. He knew she was annoyed, and he felt bad, but he didn't know how else he could be handling this. Please be patient with me. Just let me get you back to the ranch, safe and sound, and out of this dark truck where we are so very much alone. Once she is back in her familiar surroundings and all the lights are on, the moment will have passed. At least, that was his plan. How could he have let himself develop such strong feelings for her? 
He wanted to smack himself. How could he have let himself kiss her? What had he been thinking? A dozen voices in his head had been screaming at him to stop, and he'd ignored them all because he'd really, really wanted to kiss her. Like his life depended on it. And though he'd regretted it, that kiss had been something. Unlike any other kiss in his life. So tender, so loaded with feeling, he shook his head, trying to shake the dangerous thoughts out of his mind. Finally, the lights of Bannon Ranch came into view, and he let himself fully exhale for the first time that evening. Well, there it is. She sounded sullen. Yes, there it is. He was suddenly self-conscious about the Bannon seeing him in his monkey suit. Do your brothers ever have to wear tuxes? Liam, no. The rest of them, yes. He chuckled. That sounded believable. I'm sure we can find you something to change into. I'm all right, but if you want me to go get anything from your place, I'm happy to. Once I've got you surrounded by overprotective brothers. I'll be okay, for tonight. Now she sounded tired. Thank you, though. I think I just want to go to sleep. What about the gingerbread? She yawned. Oh yeah. Gingerbread first. Then sleep. Are you sure there's going to be gingerbread? This struck him as strange. She hadn't been to the ranch in days. How did she know what her mother had been baking? I'm not sure, but it's the right time of year. If there isn't any, I'm sure I can talk her into it tomorrow. Good. Speaking of tomorrow, do you have anything planned? She'd given him a calendar, but he didn't trust it. Her little clowning appointment hadn't been on the calendar. No. You're pretty much off the hook now till Christmas. Really? Yep. I don't have much planned. Or anything really. I will probably watch Christmas movies in my pajamas and eat a lot, and then we'll have a big shindig on Christmas, hey, you don't have to work on Christmas, you know. I'm sure you'd rather be with your family. I'll talk to Callum about it, but I'm not worried. As long as I can see my family for a few hours, we'll all be happy. Like I said, Christmas isn't a big deal for the bishops. I know Callum will say yes, to that. I know it too, but it depends on what you're doing and what you need. I was plenty motivated to keep you safe before, but now that the lunatic brought a gun into your life, well, now I don't really want to let you out of my sight until he's locked away. She gasped. I could come with you then. What? I'm sorry? Come with me where? If you end up going home for Christmas, I could come with you, and then I wouldn't be out of your sight. And I'd love to meet your family. She gasped again. Or maybe they could join us for our family Christmas. No, he said shortly. No, no. I don't think my sister would be up for that. Neither would his mother, but he only needed one scapegoat. Anyway, let's go talk to Callum about your PI idea. We can worry about Christmas when it gets here. He drove right up to the steps so that she wouldn't have far to walk out in the open. Go ahead in. I'll be right there. Holden pulled his truck door open. Go on inside. We heard what happened. I'll park the truck. Oh. Okay. Feeling a little silly having a valet, Isaac got out of the truck and walked Dee Dee inside. As soon as the door shut behind them, he relaxed. Nice thick walls in the middle of nowhere surrounded by family. This was a good place to be. Callum met them in the foyer. Well, well, sounds like things are officially out of hand. Yeah, I think this guy might be more dangerous than we initially thought, Isaac said. Callum nodded thoughtfully. But Dee Dee had a good idea, Isaac said. Yeah, yeah, Dee Dee said. Would you tell him all about it, Isaac? I'm going to go look for gingerbread. He was sad to watch her go. He was even sadder that he was the one who made her sad. But he turned to face her brother. First things first. They had to neutralize the threat. Then he would figure out how to explain to her that he wasn't the man for her. Chapter 23 Are you bored? Dee Dee looked up from her movie to look at Isaac, who was staring out the window. Not at all. I like boring. 
he didn't turn from the window. So you are bored. But you claim you like it. Now he turned. Sorry. I shouldn't have used that word. I meant that I like peace and quiet. And I didn't claim anything. If I say it, then it's true. Sorry, didn't mean to suggest otherwise. His honesty vow made her like him even more when she was trying to like him less. It had been two days since the gala, and he hadn't come within ten feet of her. A few times she'd found herself wishing that Milton would show up just so she would have an excuse to leap into Isaac's arms again. Any word from the P.I.? Nope. Nothing, he said. I can't believe Milton is smart enough to hide from a professional investigator. He must have help. Probably his mother. Callum said the guy's got eyes on his mother's house. Apparently, she can't stand him. Dee Dee would have laughed if it weren't so sad. Will you please come watch this movie with me? I'll even start it over. I feel so silly trying to relax while you stand guard. Your family is paying me to stand guard. Okay, that's true, but can we pay you this once to watch a movie? He cocked his eyebrow. That's just too weird, even for me. She giggled. You know what I mean. Nothing is going to happen. He wouldn't even make it up the driveway. And if he tries to get to us across the land, someone will spot him before he gets within a mile of us. Legend will be barking his head off. What if he comes by sky? She blinked and looked up at him quickly before realizing he was joking. Oh, funny man, now, huh? I still think legend would sound the alarm. Isaac grinned, and she thought she was making progress, but then he turned back to the window. She was frustrated, but what could she do? Beg. Wine. No, fine then. She turned the volume up. I'll just sit here with all my friends and watch the movie alone. I'm listening to it. She gave up then and tried not to pout. But apparently he sensed her sadness because he took one step away from the window. Isn't this supposed to be the most hated Christmas movie ever? What? No way. She hurried to look it up on her phone. What are you searching for, he asked. World's worst Christmas movie? Close. Most hated Christmas movies. He laughed, which made her feel better. Goodness, falling for him was quite the roller coaster. There, she cried, holding her phone out toward him. On the list of the ten most hated Christmas movies of all time, this is only number two. He laughed then, really laughed. He tipped his head back and everything. Then why are you watching it? What? I didn't know it was hated until you just told me. And I don't care what the critics say. I have always loved this movie. He looked at the TV screen, looked at her, and looked at the screen again. Why do you like it? She pulled her blanket up to her chin. She wasn't cold, but she was suddenly feeling self-conscious. Was he expecting her to say something intelligent here? She wasn't a film critic. I don't know. It's funny. And it's Christmassy. Gives me all those good Christmas feelings. Immediately she wished she hadn't said that last part. Isaac might not know what it was to feel Christmassy. And I remember when it first came out, I liked all the decorations. Yeah, I noticed. He returned to the window. I don't think you guys have left a single barn without lights. Even your mother's garden shed has some. I'm pretty sure Ma's garden shed was the first building to get lights. She takes her garden shed pretty seriously. He sighed, folding his arms in front of him. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead and enjoy your movie. As much as she loved this movie, she would much rather be talking to him, and not because she'd already seen the movie a dozen times. Why do you think it's so hated? He shrugged. I remember my mother saying something about it being terrible. My sister liked it, briefly, or at least got caught watching it. And my mom hated it said that it had bombed in the theaters because no real people treat Christmas like that. Uh-oh. The whole premise is that if they skip Christmas, they can afford to go on a cruise, right? I can see why that would annoy a single mother who couldn't afford to go to the grocery store. 
You're right, she said softly. I'm sorry. He turned to face her. No, I'm sorry. You shouldn't feel bad for having good Christmases. He took one step closer. I didn't mean to make you feel bad. I was just talking, that's all. Okay. She didn't know what else to say. She didn't want him to feel bad either. Why was this so awkward? It hadn't been this awkward at the gala when he'd held her in his arms. He came behind the couch and rested a hand on her shoulder. I'm really sorry. Can we just hit rewind? Hey, I'll even watch the movie with you. If you watch the movie with me, then yes. He chuckled and came around to the front of the couch to sit down. Unfortunately, he sat on the extreme end of the couch, but at least he was on her side of the room now. And you can even make fun of it if you want. Apparently, that's an American Christmas tradition. Oh. I love this movie. Brooke breezed into the room. This made Dee Dee feel a little better. Brooke hadn't grown up in the perfect family, and she could still enjoy the story. For a second, Dee Dee thought that Brooke was going to plop down right between them, but instead she looked down at Dee Dee and said, scoot over. Good old Brooke. Dee Dee made a show of being annoyed, silently vowing to thank Brooke later. She scooted down toward Isaac. This is such a good book too, Brooke said. Of course she'd read the book. There's a book? Isaac cried, sounding horrified. Sure is. Brooke chirped. By John Grisham. John Grisham? Dee Dee said. Doesn't he write legal thrillers? Brooke shrugged. What can I say? Even lawyers get in the Christmas spirit. Isaac groaned. Can't we just watch Die Hard? Dee Dee giggled. I'd already planned to watch that one next. Chapter 24 Isaac hadn't realized that the historic Bannon family home had a giant living room that they never used until he stepped into it on Christmas morning. Apparently, the room that he thought was the living room was just a den or something. And once he saw the giant Christmas tree, he felt stupid. He hadn't seen a tree anywhere else in the home, so he should have realized that there was a common room he hadn't seen yet. It wasn't like the Bannons were going to go without a tree. Besides, this was the only room they'd all fit in, though they did give it their best shot in the dining room every weekend. This room was massive. A giant cathedral ceiling made the 15-foot-tall tree seem less extravagant, though it was completely loaded with ornaments and lights. If someone had asked him, he would have guessed that a Bannon Christmas tree would look like something out of a catalog, like a professional had done it with color-coordinated ornaments and lights. But that's not what this was. This looked like 30 years' worth of ornaments made in Sunday school craft lessons. And who had put those lights up? A toddler. A tangle of multicolor and white light strands, he'd never seen anything less symmetrical. His eyes climbed the tree. Nope, not a toddler, unless the toddler had been exceptionally tall for his age and standing on Callum's shoulders. Dee Dee came to stand beside him. What are you looking at? Just wondering who decorated the tree. Oh, it was a family affair. And the lights? Was that your job? No, I was wrapping presents when that happened. I think Sonny was in charge of the lights. Oh, of course, the hippie. He didn't know Sonny well, but he wasn't surprised that she might think it artistic to simply throw a strand of lights at the tree and call the result inspired. You don't like it? Oh no. He said quickly. It's just a lot to take in. He hated this small talk with Dee Dee. It was so awkward. He really wished he'd had the courage to have a grown-up conversation the day after the gala, but he'd chickened out, and the more time that went by, the more impossible it felt to instigate that conversation. He'd accidentally kissed her a week ago, and then he'd pretended that it never happened. What an idiot. And she was being so gracious to let him pretend like that. Maybe she was pretending too. Maybe she was wishing she hadn't kissed a bishop. Someone pressed play somewhere, and Joe Di Messina belted out the first words of, I'll be home for Christmas. Goosebumps broke out on his arms. For the first time, he understood why this song was so popular. For years in the service, his friends had liked it, and he hadn't understood why. 
but if he'd had a home like this to get back to, he might have liked it more. Would you like some eggnog? Dee Dee almost shouted over the music. He shook his head. No, thank you. Suit yourself. She left him for the large table that was buried in cakes and fudge and puddings and sugar cookies shaped like snowmen. And yes, eggnog. And punch. And a bowl of something green he couldn't identify. Dee Dee returned with a cup of eggnog and a small bowl that looked like whipped cream with raspberries on top. He'd been determined not to partake, but man that really looked good. What is that? he asked when she caught him staring. Irish trifle. You want some? Irish what? She giggled. Trifle. It's like... Um... Layers of fruit and jam and sponge cake and custard and whipped cream. Sort of. But it's better than all those things. It's kind of magical. Now his stomach had joined his taste buds in demanding he try some. Here take mine. I'll go get another. She turned away before he could protest, drinking her eggnog as she walked. She returned a moment later with a new bowl. You haven't tried it yet? I was waiting for you. Oh, how sweet. Well, dig in, please. I want to see how much you love it. He took a small bite and almost moaned, it was so delicious. He swallowed and licked his lips. Wow. Do you know how to make this? She smiled. Sort of. But I'm not as good as Ma. Is your mother Irish? She gave him a scolding look. Don't let her hear you talk like that. He rolled his eyes at her Irish pride. I mean, I know that your dad was, but I didn't know if she had Irish lineage too. Yeah. She took another bite and then said, we all do. Yep, I think that's how genetics works. She laughed with her mouth full and playfully punched him with the hand that held the spoon. She had whipped cream on her bottom lip, and he really, really wanted to take care of that for her. Instead he focused on his own dessert, which was disappearing much too quickly. You don't look Irish, he said when the awkward silence had stretched too long. I know. I've been hearing that my whole life. We've got some American Indian mixed into the pot, and it all shows up in me. Well, and in Liam, I guess. He was the only other Bannon who didn't have red hair. Even the grandkids did. But trust me, I am very much Irish. I don't know. In Liam, I see it, but you? Not so much. What don't you see? She sounded offended. I don't know, the famous Irish temper? She sighed. I don't have much to be angry about. But I do have the Irish stubborn streak as well as the magnetic charm and love for family. She smiled brightly and leaned into him playfully. The whipped cream was still there. He was going to have to stop looking at her. He wanted more of the trifle or whatever it was called, but when she offered, he said no. He tried to stop her from taking care of his bowl, but he failed. Liam came to stand alongside him while he was alone, and he panicked a little, thinking maybe he should have followed her to the kitchen. Sure do appreciate you being here, man. No problem. No big plans today. Going to go check in on my mother a little later, but that's all. He looked around. Though I don't think Dee Dee is in much danger in the middle of all of you. No, she's not, but crazy people can get extra crazy around the holidays, so I'm glad to have an extra set of eyes and ears here, just in case. Blade came bouncing up and stood beside her husband, smiling from ear to ear. Do you know everyone, Isaac? His eyes traveled the room. Yep. I think I do. Though knowing and having seen someone before were two different things, he went with the flow. Blade did not believe him. She looped her arm through his and pointed. Everyone knows Ma Bannon. She's famous. Yes, indeed. She was sitting in the rocking chair holding Callum's baby, who was trying to outsing Joe D. Messina. And that's little Morgan there in her arms. And Callum's two older boys, she yanked him around to look at the other side of the room. That there is David and Jacob. And you know me and Liam. 
we don't have kids yet, but come back next year, and things might be different. She winked at her husband, and Isaac felt uncomfortable. And that there is Patrick's woman, Sonny, and her crazy mother Gloria. These Bannons sure did like the throw around the word crazy. What's her mother doing here? Liam asked. He'd apparently just noticed. No idea. I think she just showed up. That woman is a few pumpkins short of a patch, Liam said. Blade playfully punched him in the shoulder. Don't forget that I invited my mother. So? So, if she shows up, are you going to insult her too? No, because she was invited. Well, maybe Sunny invited her mother too. Liam laughed. Fine. You win. Isaac could see why Liam liked her. She certainly had some pluck. He didn't think he'd be able to keep up with her, but he could see why Liam liked her. Anyway, Blade continued. You know Finn, and that's his new woman Grace. Not exactly new, Liam said. They've been joined at the hip since kindergarten. Okay, but now they're talking about marriage, and that part's new. A pang of jealousy struck Isaac. All of these people were so happy. His eyes drifted to Dee Dee. Why was she still single? Maybe she's been waiting for you, an obnoxious voice whispered in his mind. He told it to shut up. He didn't need to be having thoughts like that. Who's that? Isaac asked to distract himself from thinking about Dee Dee. That's David's girlfriend, Monica. Good grief, even the kid had a date. And that's Shane, his wife Laurel, and their daughter Julia. I'm surprised she could make it. Figured she'd be at a softball game. What? Isaac cried. There was two feet of snow outside, and it was Christmas. She's kidding, Liam said, but her schedule is almost that crazy. Makes me hope our kid doesn't want to play softball. Or baseball. Or whatever. Your kid will never want to leave the ranch, Blade said. Nah, he'll want to go to football, Liam said, sounding proud of the kid he didn't have yet. I think that's everybody, Blade said. It's a little overwhelming, but you get used to it. She said this as if he were joining the family. Her phone beeped, and she looked down at it. Oh. Mom's here. She flashed him a quick smile. Merry Christmas, and welcome aboard. Welcome aboard? What had she meant by that? Did she think something was happening between Dee Dee and him? He spotted Holden helping himself to the eggnog and realized that the Bannons did let some employees into the fold. So maybe they weren't trying to play matchmaker. Maybe they were only being kind. That made more sense. Chapter 25 Dee Dee was worried about Isaac. He seemed so uncomfortable. As piles and piles of gifts were delivered from under and around the tree, she wished there were more for him. She'd gotten him one, of course, but Holden was already opening his third gift. She got David's attention and tried to be subtle as she pointed at Isaac's gift. David picked it up and then squinted at the tag, and Dee Dee felt bad about her handwriting. She'd managed to get him to finally pick up Isaac's only gift, now how was she going to tell him who to give it to? She was just going to have to come out with it. She opened her mouth to translate, but David figured it out. Isaac. He scanned the room, trying to remember who Isaac was. Finally, he handed him the present. Isaac took it tentatively and looked at Dee Dee. From you? She smiled and nodded, leaning into him. Open it. She was excited to see his reaction. She loved giving gifts. I wish I'd known. I didn't get you anything. That's okay. She hadn't expected him to, but now that she was in this situation, she could see how it might be awkward for him. She leaned closer and whispered, You've saved my life. The least I could do was get you a Christmas gift. He seemed to accept this reasoning and tore off more than half the wrapping paper with one swipe. But then he didn't react at all. He didn't even open the box. Granted, the box told him what was inside, but still. He just whispered, thank you. For your house, she explained. She didn't want him to think that she expected him to hang a hat rack in her house. 
I only have the one hat, he muttered. She hadn't known that, thought now that he said it, she realized she'd never seen more than one. Right, but now that you have a place to store them, you can start your collection. Good save, she told herself. He smiled. Thank you, he said again. Fine, next Christmas she was going to have to get him multiple cowboy hats. She really hoped she'd still be shopping for him in a year. He'd be much more comfortable next time. Sometimes it took a few Bannon Christmas experiences for people to stop being overwhelmed. Blade was certainly more comfortable this year than she had been for her first. She'd even invited her mom, which was awesome. Blade had been working hard to strengthen that relationship. It was Dee Dee's turn to open a present, something from Liam and Blade. A pair of gorgeous gold earrings in a unique design. Wow, thanks, guys. She loved getting presents that she didn't know she wanted. Well, she loved getting all presents, but this was one of her favorite kinds. We had them custom made, Blade said. They're supposed to look like our brand, but they don't. No, they sure didn't. She turned them upside down to see if that helped. Nope. So now you know what you're getting next year, Liam said. We'll try again. As she laughed, Isaac shifted in his chair. I'll be right back. He started to get up, but David said, wait, another one for you. Isaac sat back down and looked at Dee Dee. Another one? She shrugged. This one's not from me. Now he looked embarrassed. She had never seen anyone struggle so much with Christmas. Hadn't the man ever been loved? It's from me, Isaac, Ma said from across the room. He smiled at her, but it looked forced. Thank you, ma'am. He unwrapped the box, and this time, the cardboard didn't announce its contents. He opened the box to reveal four glasses with maps etched on them. He took one out for a closer look. The maps were of West Hope. Dee Dee gasped. That's so cool, Ma. Isaac's eyes welled with tears. This time he didn't excuse himself as he quickly got up and left the room, leaving the glasses on his seat. Dee Dee didn't understand why he was upset. She thought about following him, but she wasn't his girlfriend. He'd made that painfully clear. Chapter 26 You don't need to go with me. Isaac really didn't want Dee Dee to witness his family's Christmas. Not that there was anything wrong with the way they did things. There wasn't. They were good people who loved one another. He'd never been ashamed of his family or his childhood home, and he wasn't now, but that didn't mean that he wanted to see it through Dee Dee's eyes. It would be quite the wake-up call for her. It might even change her understanding of what Christmas was, and he didn't want that to happen. You'll be perfectly safe here, he said to her, and Callum agrees with that. He's going to make sure someone is always close to you and keeping an eye out until I get back. But I want to go, Isaac. I want to meet your family. He knew that. She'd already said it at least three times. How could he make her understand that he didn't want her to go? How could he do that without being rude? Without hurting her feelings? And then it came to him. I think you will be safer here. No need to take you out into the open, all the way into town, and when I'm there at the house, I want to be able to focus on my family and not watching the perimeter. Oh. Her beautiful, dark eyes grew sad. Okay. She stepped back. Go ahead. Now he'd done it. He stood there foolishly, wondering what to do. He'd managed to get rid of her, which is what he wanted, so why were his boots glued to the floor? She left the foyer, and he already missed her. Dee Dee, wait, he called after her, but she didn't reappear. Maybe she hadn't heard him. Or maybe she didn't want him to see how upset she was. Or maybe she was mad at him. He hated this. When was the last time he'd expended so much energy wondering how a woman felt or worrying about what she thought? Never. He'd never done this. Because he'd never felt like this. This was a new problem. He started after her. But she wasn't in the giant living room, and she wasn't in the smaller living room. Where had she gone? He went upstairs and knocked on her bedroom door, but there was no answer. 
he didn't think she would ignore him, and he wasn't about to barge in, so he went back downstairs. He started to ask Blade if she'd seen Dee Dee, but he didn't want to raise alarm. A bodyguard losing his charge was an alarming event, and it would be hard to explain that she wasn't missing but only hiding from him. But then he saw Sunny, and he didn't think that woman was capable of alarm. Hey, Sunny. I'm off the clock, so don't think this is alarming, he started and then wished he hadn't used so many words, but have you seen Dee Dee? Oh, yes, she said brightly. She pointed. Kitchen. And that's where he found her, with her head in the fridge. He knew she wasn't hungry. Was she trying to hide? Was she like a rabbit, thinking that if she couldn't see anyone else, then they couldn't see her? She pulled herself out, along with a large bowl of Irish trifle. Good grief, how much of that stuff had Mrs. Bannon made? No wonder she needed two refrigerators. Hungry, he said, trying to be funny. But his stupid quip startled her, she bobbled the bowl and then clumsily tried to catch it, which made the situation so, so much worse. He knew the bowl was going down, so he dove for it, but there was a giant, solid wooden dining room table in the way, and all he did was crack his hip bone on the edge of it. He tried not to cry out. Like a little kid and ended up grunting like a wild boar instead, but he didn't think she heard it because she was shrieking, shrieking because the large glass bowl, which had apparently had its entire outer surface greased with oil, was flying free now. Isaac tried to lunge again, but he didn't even come close to saving the day. Not this time. Oh phew, he thought, as the bowl landed on its bottom, maybe not all was lost, but the bowl defied physics as it bounced and flipped over, landing top down on the floor. Dee Dee, who was now squatting like a baseball catcher, looked up at him with wide, shiny eyes. What do we do, she whispered. We? He thought. He hadn't ruined Ma Bannon's masterpiece. This was squarely on the baby of the family's shoulders. But then he also knew that he would take the blame if she wanted him to. Uh... I don't know. I guess it's a good thing that it's all still in the bowl, right? Maybe. Can we flip it over and maybe scrape off the top layer? That's brilliant, she said as if he just explained dark matter, and she sprang up to a stand. She ran to a drawer and pulled out a spatula, turned to look at the mess, and then turned back to the drawer. She pulled out a thin, white, plastic sheet. Do you think this would work? I have no idea. What is it? It's... I don't know what it's called. Ma uses it to roll out fondant. What's fondant? She rolled her eyes. Never mind. We have a thin piece of plastic. I think it will work. It wasn't big enough. Do you have two of them? Why would she have two of them? Why wouldn't she have two of everything, she was a billionaire. I don't know. But it's not big enough. She looked like she was going to cry. Try the spatula too. He squatted down for a closer look, and she was in such a hurry that when she scooched across from him, her forehead bonked the brim of his hat, knocking it forward like she was trying to blind him. He straightened it, as she sheepishly said, sorry. It's okay. Let's just take a breath, okay? Haste makes waste, right? She nodded and took an audible long, deep breath. Okay. Now what? He had no idea. He'd never rescued an Irish trifle from a hardwood floor before. He took the plastic sheet from her shaking hand. Why was she so upset? What was the worst that could happen? Dee Dee, it's okay. I mean, we're going to do our best here, but it's just dessert. I know. But Ma worked so hard, and I don't want to ruin Christmas. He flinched. This woman was awesome and gorgeous and lovable, but she was also so out of touch with reality. She had no idea what a ruined Christmas looked like. The baby Jesus grew up and saved the world. I think Christmas is safe. Good point. Okay, here goes nothing. He tried to slide the thin plastic under the bowl, and the whole bowl shifted, leaving a thin smear of delicious on the floor behind it. I'll hold it. She braced the opposite side of the bowl, and he tried again, but his floppy plastic tool didn't slide nearly as easily as he'd expected. What was this stuff, glue? 
It certainly wasn't whipped cream. At least, it wasn't like any whipped cream he'd ever encountered. Maybe it was Irish whipped cream, stubborn. He pushed harder, and she also pushed harder on the other end to keep the bowl in place. Footsteps sounded in the hallway, and they both froze like criminals. Don't breathe, she said and then clamped a hand over her mouth to hold back the giggles. She sure thought she was hilarious. The footsteps passed, and he exhaled. Okay, let's try again. He pushed, she pushed, and slowly, the plastic sheet was going under the bowl. But he'd been right. It wasn't big enough. He got it all the way under. Now what? Now the spatula. She easily shoved the metal spatula under the edge. Apparently metal worked a lot better for this task than floppy plastic with a dull edge. So now they had an upside-down bowl of fluff covering a piece of plastic that they couldn't grab, and a spatula jammed under one edge. Do you think we can flip it? she asked, her eyes shining with hope. No. He did not think it was anywhere near flippable. Um, do you have three more spatulas? She jumped up. I think so. Oh sure, no extra fondant sheets, but an abundance of spatulas. She came back with a plastic spatula with an inconveniently thick edge, a wide dull knife, and a two-foot-long grilling spatula that probably would have completed the task on its own if they'd started with it. He wanted to laugh, but he didn't want her to think he was laughing at her. How had his life gotten so frivolous? He'd been returning insurgents' gunfire only six months ago. She handed him the heavy-duty grilling tool, and he slid it under the dessert opposite the current spatula. Then she held up the wide, dull knife. What is that thing? Frosting spreader. He smirked. Is that its technical name? She ignored his sarcasm and slid it under the edge closest to her. Now they had to deal with the cheap rubber thing. He thought they could probably find a better tool for the job, but he was tired of the job and caring less and less about its success as the minutes ticked by. He was going to be late for his Christmas because he was squatting over a pile of stubborn whipped cream in the Bannon mansion. She looked up at him. Okay, ready? She put one hand on the original spatula handle and one on the grilling tool. Ready. What's the plan? She looked down at the remaining two handles. You grab those, and then we flip? Oh boy. He put his hands on the handles, noting that she'd given him the rubber thing and the frosting spreader and kept the two good handles for herself. This was destined to fail, and she was setting him up as a scapegoat. Which way are we flipping? Her surprise at this question told him exactly how this was going to go. Right, she said. Your right or mine? She looked to her right. That way. Okay. On the count of three? She nodded, and the concentration on her face was downright adorable. It was all he could do not to plant one on her right then and there. You count, she said without looking up at him. Okay. One, two. Wait. He sighed. What? Are we flipping fast or slow and steady? It was going to fail either way. How would you like to do it? Slow and steady, I think. Okay, slow and steady it is. One, two, three. They each lifted with one hand, using the other devices as fulcrums. The grilling tool did the bulk of the work, and it almost seemed they were going to succeed until the fondant sheet decided to stick to the floor. Abruptly, Isaac let go of one of the spatulas and slapped the stupid plastic sheet back into place. He did it with a little too much oomph because it splattered, small white drops of trifle landing on Dee Dee's long luscious eyelashes. But he didn't have time to laugh because the bowl was still moving. And then there it was. Correct side up, looking only a little worse for wear. His semi-aggressive slap had dented the top a little, but maybe they could fluff it with a fork or something. She looked up at him, seemingly unaware that something was weighing down her eyelids. You've got some. Uh, he wanted to help, but he wasn't about to touch her eyelashes. Sorry. I splashed some on your. On my what, Isaac? Spit it out? She said it with such sass that he laughed aloud. Shh, she scolded. 
Someone will come see why we're having so much fun. Joe De Messina was still belting out the carols in the other room, so he doubted anyone could hear him chuckle on the kitchen floor, but he didn't argue. Your ma really has a thing for Joe De Messina, huh? Really, Isaac? Really? You choose this exact moment to inquire about my mother's musical tastes? He sighed. This wasn't the crisis she thought it was, but he didn't want to disrupt her worldview, whoa. The realization almost knocked him over sideways. What is it? You have whipped cream on your eyelashes, he said steadily, even though he felt anything but steady. She wiped it away, or more like rubbed it in, never taking her eyes off him. What else? Something just freaked you out. No, no, it's nothing. But she was right. Something had freaked him out. Because here he sat, the perpetually irritable Isaac Bishop, watching a billionaire heiress freak out and panic about, well, quite literally spilled whipped milk, and he wasn't freaking out and losing his cool. He wasn't even irritated. He was objectively aware of how ridiculous she was being, but if anything, he was, amused. Amused? Was that possible? What was this woman doing to him? You're lying, but I don't have time to analyze that right now. She wiped at her forehead with the back of her hand. The stress of the situation was actually making her sweat. So, what's next? Who had put him in charge of this rescue mission? He tried to sound like he was taking this whole thing appropriately seriously when he said, I think we need to peel off the fondant sheet. Fondant, she corrected his pronunciation. Whatever. He still didn't know what fondant was, so why did he need to know how to pronounce it? So we peel it off, then you make the dessert look good again, and I clean the floor. Her face fell. I don't know if I can make it look good again. It's going to take more than replacing the sprinkles. We've lost so much of the cream. So whip it with a fork or something. Whip it with a fork, she cried. What is wrong with you? Let's get this over with. He grabbed the white plastic sheet and started pulling. Stop, she cried, loudly enough for everyone in the house to hear. Probably the bunkhouse heard it. He froze. What? Look at how much cream you're taking with it. So scrape it off, he cried, unintentionally matching her wild energy. Her panic was contagious. Oh. Good idea. She picked up the frosting spreader and started scraping. She whimpered. Oh no. The sprinkles are getting mixed up with the cream. You know what, don't worry about it. I'll eat the whole bowl as fast as I can before Ma notices. She giggled. I dare you. Now he was challenged. He was going to be so late for the Bishop Christmas. And he was going to be sick for it. Keep scraping, she ordered. I am. What does it look like I'm doing? And then the fondant sheet was free, and the lumpy, bumpy mess of sparkly cream was left behind. Oh, it looks awful, she said. It hit the floor, Dee Dee. It could be so much worse. She frowned at him, and her eyes locked with his, and then her frown slowly spread into a weird grin. Hey, she said softly. What? I'm being completely unreasonable here. I am totally freaking out over something that totally doesn't matter in the great scheme of things, and you're not even annoyed. Yeah, yeah, you cured me. Can we get this show on the road? He picked up the bowl and stood up. It felt good to straighten his legs. How long had he been squatting there? It must be New Year's by now. He carried it to the counter and waved his hand at it. Go ahead, work your magic. I don't think I have enough magic for that. He squared his body to look at her. You have your mother's DNA. You can do this. He turned to the sink to find a dishcloth or towel. By the time he'd wiped up the mess and rinsed out the towel, she had finished with her repairs. Hey, that's not half bad. She's going to know something happened. I scraped so much off that the dessert looks like it's half missing. Can we just squirt some more whipped cream in there and then stir? She laughed. You're insane. I'm serious. Your mother's not going to eat this, is she? 
And anyone else who notices that it tastes funny isn't going to say anything because they don't want to hurt her feelings. My mother doesn't keep canned whipped cream in her kitchen, she said with a snobby little attitude. Oh wait. Someone did get some because David keeps slathering it on his gingerbread. Maybe we still have some. She hurried to the fridge and then let out a happy squeal. She came running back with a can in her hands. This is just crazy enough to work. She started squirting and seemed to be having so much fun that he made her stop. You don't want the dessert to grow, Dee Dee. We're just trying to keep it from shrinking. He carefully wrested the can from her hand. And then she went to work stirring and fluffing. He couldn't believe it. This might actually work. They made a good team. Maybe they should pursue a life of crime together. She shook on some sparkly sprinkles and then stood back. Would you look at that? She sounded so proud that he almost laughed at her. What is taking you so, her mother stopped short. Oh, sorry, I thought Isaac had left. Oh great. Now Ma Bannon thought she'd caught them having a secret rendezvous in the kitchen. Chapter 27 Dee Dee's little dessert caper had wreaked so much havoc that when Isaac finally did leave the house, Dee Dee pretended to forget that she wasn't supposed to tag along. She ran out and hopped in the truck, and he didn't argue. She held her breath until he was far enough down the driveway that she was sure he wouldn't bother turning around. Then she exhaled slowly, quite pleased with herself. She really wanted to meet his family. Plus, enjoying another Christmas get-together felt like a good way to stretch out her holiday. He was silent as he drove, and she started to feel bad. Had she been manipulative? Maybe. Pushy? Definitely. But if she apologized, it would only call attention to her bad behavior, so she didn't. You must be excited to see everyone, she said to break the silence. Yep. She didn't know what he was feeling right now, but it might be the opposite of excited. Hey, you don't have to be embarrassed of your family. His face jerked toward her. What? I'm not embarrassed of anything. Oh dear. Open mouth, insert foot. Okay. Good. She felt like a puddle of slime. And I didn't mean to suggest that you should be, or that they were the type of people someone might be embarrassed of. Please stop. I know you didn't mean anything bad by it, but you're digging the hole deeper. He was right. Okay, sorry. He sighed. It's okay. Really. Don't read too much into my sullenness. I told you, I just don't really love Christmas. But I do love my family. And I guess I am a little excited for you to meet my nephews. They're pretty terrific, and now that I know how much kids love you, well, they're going to love you. Do you know if they've ever been to our program at church? I am confident they have not, and if I were you, I wouldn't invite them. What? Why? How could inviting someone to church be a bad thing? That's a good way to irritate my sister. She's not the church type. She let the cab of the truck stay quiet until he pulled into his mother's driveway. Instantly she thought of all the ways her family's ranch could help improve this place. The roof was patched, there was a broken window, and the foundation was cracked. And that's only what she could see at first glance. She would talk to Callum, but they'd learned years ago that they had to be careful just randomly helping people. It could do more harm than good. Last chance to back out, he said. She smiled at him. Not a chance. She slid out of the truck and hurried toward the door. She'd worked far too hard to get here to bail now. Stepping into the small home did not bring the rush of warmth Dee Dee had expected, and when Isaac offered to take her coat, she was tempted to decline, but no one else was still wearing their coats, so she vowed to tough it out. You must be Dee Dee, an older woman said. Nice to meet you. Relief washed over Dee Dee. Nice to meet you as well. You were at the restaurant with Isaac. She gave her son a confused look, but then her eyes lit up. Oh. That was you. She chuckled. I did not want Isaac to interfere that night, but I guess now I'm glad that he did. Dee Dee wanted to give her a big hug, but she restrained herself. Can I get you something to drink? 
beside her, Isaac stiffened, and she didn't know why. No, thank you. Okay, then. She stood there awkwardly for a second, started to say something else, and then went into the living room. She seemed nervous, but Dee Dee really hoped that wasn't the case. Dee Dee followed Isaac, who followed his mother into the living room, where a small artificial tree stood in the corner. It boasted a lot of ornaments, which made Dee Dee think that maybe this family wasn't such a lost cause. Maybe, given a few years, she could make them Christmas lovers. A woman eyed her from a worn recliner. That had to be Isaac's sister. Hi. I'm Dee Dee. She didn't return the smile. Veronica. Nice to meet you. This room was even colder than the kitchen had been. Dee Dee sat very close to Isaac on the couch, mostly just for the warmth of him. How was your Christmas morning? Isaac's mother asked him. Good. Crowded. He gave Dee Dee a small smile. The dessert was good. Oh really? What did you make? She asked Dee Dee expectantly. She still looked uncomfortable. Oh, I didn't make anything. I'm sure they have at least one chef on staff, Veronica said. In that big mansion. Ronnie, stop, Isaac said. It's not like that at all. They don't have a chef. Dee Dee's mother does all the cooking. Dee Dee's cheeks grew hot. Isaac had been trying to stick up for her, but he'd made it sound like the Bannon adults were all still little kids whose mommy cooked for them. Dee Dee forced a smile. I don't actually live there anymore. It's my oldest brother's house now, but my mother still lives there too, and she loves to cook. They can't make her stop. She still cooks for a lot of the help as well. Veronica rolled her eyes. Ah. Uh. Yes, the help. She means the ranch hands, Isaac snapped. They don't have servants. Dee Dee took a shaky breath. What had she walked into? No, what had she forced her way into? Veronica, I've tried to tell you. Just because they have some money doesn't mean they're evil. I've spent every waking moment with them for weeks, and they're not the least bit snobby. You're the one acting stuck up right now. Okay, kids. His mother gave Veronica a stern look. Besides, I know the Bannons give lots of money away. Who do you think paid for that playground your sons love so much? Veronica had no answer for this. Being much more comfortable with children than with bitter adults, Dee Dee smiled at the closest boy. What's your name? Addison, he said shyly. Well, that's a cool name. Nice to meet you Addison. I'm Kieran. Kieran, she cried, smiling at Isaac. That's an Irish name. I know that, Veronica snapped. I'm the one who named him. I didn't mean to, Dee Dee tried, but Veronica wouldn't let her finish. If you're not too full from all your Bannon desserts, I brought pie, Veronica said. Dee Dee had seen how much trifle Isaac had eaten. He had successfully obscured the evidence of the spill by dipping the big spoon in again and again. So she knew he couldn't possibly have room for pie. Pie sounds great. He stood and looked down at her. Would you like some? She started to get up. No, please, he said emphatically. I'll get it for you. She swallowed. Sure. Pie sounds great. Thank you. She watched him go, and then returned his mother's smile. The woman was really trying. So, Dee Dee, Isaac tells me that you're quite the volunteer. A real jack of all trades. Or should I say Jill? It gave her a small thrill that Isaac had talked to his mother about her. I don't do that many different things, really. But he's just been introduced to them all at once, so it seems like a lot. Veronica was watching her boys, but Dee Dee could still feel the bitterness rolling off her. That's nice, his mother said. I used to volunteer at the library, but now all of my volunteer hours are done babysitting. She laughed lightly. Is that supposed to make me feel guilty, mom? No, dear. His mother stopped trying then. She leaned back in her chair and stared at the television, which was off. The three women sat in a painful silence until Isaac returned with two pieces of pie on mismatched plates. 
Dee Dee took one of them and waited for him to sit down before taking a bite. She hadn't eaten nearly as much trifle as he had, but she still didn't have much room for pie, so this had better be good. It was not. In fact, it was awful. It was as dry as unbuttered popcorn, and her thirst roared to life. Her stress level was already making her mouth dry, and she had trouble swallowing, but she forced the pie in one bite at a time, praying she wouldn't gag. If you gag on his sister's pie, even if it is as dry as dehydrated sawdust, you can kiss any hope of a relationship with this man. Goodbye. Finally, the pie plates were clean, and Veronica and her mother were talking about a new teacher at the elementary school. Dee Dee didn't know him, but he sounded terrible. Suddenly Veronica's eyes were on her. You must know someone on the school board. The school board? Isaac stood, slid the plate out of her hand, and left her to fend for herself. I'm not sure. I. I'm not even sure who's on the school board. Leave her out of this, Veronica. There's no Bannon on the school board? Isn't that a little out of character? Dee Dee decided that she officially disliked Veronica, and she didn't know how much longer she was going to be able to play nice. Isaac returned and wordlessly handed her a glass of water. The only Bannons who would make sense on the school board don't have time to serve on the school board. You should serve on the school board, Veronica said pointedly. What? I don't have any kids. So? So? So let's open presents. Isaac declared after he drained half his glass of water. The boys cheered loudly. We've been waiting forever. Addison said. Sorry I made you wait, Isaac said. He leaned back in the cushions and put his arm around Dee Dee, a move that surprised her. She took a drink of her water, trying to act like it wasn't the best, most delicious, most necessary water she'd ever had. She felt like she'd hiked across a desert. We had a small accident at the ranch, and I had to help clean it up. Accident? Addison said, intrigued. Oh yes, your friend Dee Dee here decided to throw her mother's dessert on the floor. Addison laughed loudly and brightly. You did? Then he laughed some more. She did. So I had to pick it up so that she didn't get in trouble. And then you came here? And then I had to eat all of the dessert to get rid of the evidence. Both boys were laughing now, and for the first time, Dee Dee was glad that she'd been a total gomp and dropped her mother's trifle on the floor. Presents, boys, Veronica said. They ran to the tree. One at a time. Addison froze and looked at his brother. You first, Kieran. Wow, what a sweetheart, Dee Dee said quietly. Yep, he really is. Must run in the family, she whispered. Chapter 28 Stop, Isaac told himself. He pulled his arm out from behind Dee Dee. He hadn't even realized he had put it around her, but he was feeling a little protective of her. He understood where Veronica was coming from, but man, she could be harsh. But protective was one thing. That was his job. Falling in love was something else altogether, and it was dangerous. If he couldn't get a grip, he was going to have to quit this job, and he didn't want to quit it. The pay was great. The benefits were great. He was happy doing it. Of course, some of that happiness was the problem. He sighed and tried to focus on his nephew's happiness instead. He tried not to notice how good Dee Dee was being with them and how much they liked her already. When she got down on the floor to play with Kieran's new toy train, Isaac called it. They'd been there for over an hour. That was enough. He'd lived enough Decembers in this house to know that the floor she just sat on was ice cold. We really should be getting back. He slid to the edge of the couch. His mother looked disappointed, but she didn't argue. She couldn't have been surprised. As far as she knew, he was on the clock. She didn't know that Dee Dee had inserted herself into his family time for some reason. Dee Dee, however, did look surprised. She also looked like she was going to protest, so he gave her a stern look and said, I promised Callum I'd have you back before dark. Oh. Okay. Dee Dee seemed unaware that Isaac had just made that up on the spot. Veronica seemed well aware. She was glaring at him. Boys, thank your uncle for the gifts. 
They came running at him and each hugged one of his legs. Thank you, they chimed. You're welcome, ya little puffballs. He tousled their hair. Now get back to your toys. Addison did as he was told, but Kieran hopped over to Dee Dee and gave her leg a hug as well. When will we see you again? His mother asked, sounding sad. It was true that he hadn't made much time for her lately. He'd been too busy with his round-the-clock security. It shouldn't be too long. They've hired a PI who's trying to catch the guy, and if they don't catch him soon, I imagine that they'll want to hire someone else to help me with this part. So then I'll be able to scoot over and see you. Again Dee Dee looked like she wanted to say something. He was grateful that she didn't. He bent to give his mother a hug, which she returned. Then he crossed the room to hug Veronica, who was stiff as a board. Merry Christmas, sis. Yeah, yeah, she said, but she patted his hand affectionately. Then he hurried out of that house, scanning his childhood yard as he ushered Dee Dee toward the truck. He knew it was coming, and he was right. As soon as he started the engine, she said, you can go visit your mother, you know, whenever you want. If you can't leave me alone, then I can come too. He took a deep breath. It was time. He was going to have to talk about this like a grown-up. I owe you an apology. What? Why? He tightened his grip on the wheel. I know I've been sending you mixed signals, and I'm sorry for that. She started to argue, and he held up one hand. Please, I know you're always about making everyone feel better about everything, but I need to get this out. She clamped her mouth shut. Okay. She mimed zipping her lips shut and throwing the key at the closed window. Obviously, I like you. And I've foolishly acted on that a few times, without thinking. And I'm sorry. I do know that nothing can happen between us, and I don't say that because I'm your employee, though that is a really convenient excuse. I say that because you're a Bannon. Because you're you, and I'm, well, me. So, we can be friendly. I appreciate you convincing me to be less grumpy. He chuckled. But I'm going to try to keep things more professional, and I'm sorry I've been inconsistent. He stopped talking. He had a nagging feeling that he'd left out some things he should have said, but he couldn't think of them. Are you done now? I think so. He heard the click of the seatbelt and looked across the cab to see what was happening. Was she going to jump? No, she wasn't, but what he was seeing made even less sense. She was sliding across the cab toward him, fast, and then she was grabbing the left side of his shirt with her right hand and pulling herself close to him. Then her sweet lips were on his, and this was very, very much not safe. He kept his eyes open, but the kiss was fast and slightly furious. Before he could decide whether to risk their lives and kiss her back or push her away, she had already pulled back. But she was still very close to him. You're an idiot. She slid back across the seat. He was completely stymied. What had just happened? It doesn't matter. Just focus on the road. He straightened in his seat and tried to concentrate on getting her home safely, which was something she apparently wasn't too concerned with. It was an awfully cold day to be driving into the ditch, but who knew what she was thinking? My friend is having a New Year's Eve party. Will you go with me? Uh... Yeah. That's my job. I know it's your job. I'm asking if you'll be my date. What was happening? Dee Dee, did you hear a word I just said? Yes. I heard you say that you like me. And then I heard some nonsense about how you can't date me because I'm a Bannon. So who's the snob now? You're too good for a Bannon? He gave her the dirtiest look he could muster. Are you kidding me? She raised both eyebrows. I am not kidding. It's not my fault my great-great-great-grandfather found gold on his property. How dare you punish me because my family has money? What if we're meant to be? Did you ever think about that? Meant to be was an awfully romantic concept. He wasn't sure he believed in it. It's not just the money. Then what is it? He didn't know how to answer that, especially when he just lectured his family about how the Bannons weren't snobby. Will you just trust me? 
It couldn't work. So you're saying that you won't go to the party as my date? He sighed. I don't know. Let's see where we are with Milton by then. No. No? He almost laughed. She was being a sassy little snot. No. I want a date. I can't wait till the last minute, or I won't be able to find one. If you won't go with me, I'll find another date. So you're going to bring a date and a bodyguard to this party? Either way this shakes out, yes. It took him a second to figure out what she meant. Ah. Uh. So we're being clever now, are we? Thank you for noticing. He groaned. And where are you going to find this date? Are you going to ask your friend Sophie to set you up with one of the firemen she knows? She let out something close to a growl, and he wondered if he'd actually made her angry. A glance across the cab told him that he hadn't, but he might have come close. That was a low blow, she said. Sorry. Fine. I'll be your date on one condition. Name it. That it doesn't mean anything serious. I meant what I said. Then never mind. What? He was getting tired. What's the point of going on a date if you're not looking for your future partner? I'm not into dating just for the heck of it. I quit that a long time ago. I thought you needed a date for the party. Never mind. I don't want to go with you. I'll find another date. Forget I asked. Now she might actually be angry. He sighed. Are you trying to make me jealous? No, Isaac. I don't play games like that. Nope. She wasn't mad. She was sad, which was so much worse. Chapter 29 You want to tell me why you're dragging around here like a teenager who listens to too much Pearl Jam? Dee Dee looked up to see Blade glaring down at her. What? What are you talking about? She sat up and rubbed the sleep out of her eyes. Talk about a rude awakening. She looked around the room. Where's Isaac? I sent him away. Dee Dee laughed. What? That's his whole job, to not go away. I know that, but I also know that you need some girl talk. She pushed Dee Dee's legs away from the edge of the couch and sat down. Ow. Dee Dee yanked her left shin out from under Blade's bony butt. How are you so strong when you're so skinny? Blade held her arm up and flexed her bicep. Who you callin' is skinny? Dee Dee rolled her eyes. What had she done to deserve this? I have to go to the bathroom. She threw her blanket off and tried to get up. No. No? You're not going to let me go to the bathroom? This woman was insane. She didn't even live here. They'd put her in charge of the horses, and it had completely gone to her head. Dee Dee tried to get up again, and Blade pushed her back down. Wait a second. I don't know how long he's going to stay gone. Did you send him on some wild goose chase? She could see Blade telling him that she'd seen Milton on the roof. Not at all. I just told him I needed to talk to you about something private. Dee Dee noticed that the door to the living room was shut. It was never shut. Okay, talk. But make it quick. I think Ma will be pretty upset if I pee on this couch. Blade looked down as if seeing the couch for the first time. Isn't this Callum's couch? Yes, but I'm not scared of Callum. Blade, what is it? Spit it out. Blade took a deep breath, and for a split second, looked less confident, but then her doubt was gone, and she was back to herself. Why are you acting like you're depressed? What? I'm not acting like that. I have never seen you like this, and I can't stand it. You're the fun-loving one. She thumped her on the kneecap, nearly shaking some pee out of her. What's your problem? I don't know, I'm being stalked so I have to stay in this house? You don't have to stay in this house, and you know it. Callum would hire the entire National Guard if you asked him to. Right, but I really don't want to deal with that. It's easier to just stay home. Blade leaned closer and lowered her voice. That's not it, and you know it. 
you're acting all weird because you've got a crush on your bodyguard. It was more than a crush. She stared at Blade, waiting for her to get to the point. So? Blade pushed. What are you going to do about it? I've done everything I can. He's not interested. What? Blade cried. Anyone with an eyeball can see that man is interested. Dee Dee, you are gorgeous. Every man within a thousand miles would be interested if given the chance. Dee Dee shrugged. Thanks for that, but I really have tried. I kissed him and everything. Woo ee. This news surprised Blade, and that made Dee Dee feel good about herself. Made her feel a little maverick. And he didn't kiss you back? No, he did. But he says that there's no future because I'm a Bannon. An odd expression fell over Blade's face. Dee Dee couldn't quite interpret it. Oh, she said, suddenly calm and almost acting like a normal person. What? What did you just figure out? Is he from some wrong side of the tracks family, or something? I'm not from around here. Yeah, I've noticed. And no, he's not. I mean, they're like most families around here. They're not exactly rolling in the dough, but he's not impoverished or anything. She actually had no idea of his financial situation, but she was making an assumption. And yet he thinks he can't be with a Bannon. She chewed her bottom lip. Okay. She scooted to the edge of the couch and aggressively patted her kneecap again. I'll fix it. She stood up. What? No, please. Blade turned and looked down at her, smiling. Why are you begging like that? You don't even know what I'm going to do. I don't want anyone to do anything. I know, and that's a problem. Someone's got to do something, or you're going to be in your pajamas the rest of your life. Please, get up, stop sleeping in the middle of the afternoon, go get some real clothes on, and put on some makeup. You're going to have a date soon. Dee Dee was speechless. She was not comfortable with the new plan, but she had no idea how to stop it. She watched Blade leave, and Isaac immediately entered. Is everything okay? She stood up. Yeah. I'm going to go take a shower. I'll be back down in a few. Okay. Dee Dee could feel his eyes on her as she left the room. She had no idea what Blade was going to do, but whatever it was, it couldn't make the situation much worse. Chapter 30 As soon as Isaac finished his breakfast, Liam asked if he could speak with him in his office. This was code for the barn, Isaac had learned. Uh... Sure. He located Dee Dee, who didn't seem to be in a hurry to leave the table, and then found his coat. The fresh air felt good in his lungs, and he followed Liam across the vast yard to the biggest barn. Liam was acting very awkward, and Isaac determined that he was about to be let go. Liam started rearranging a very cluttered shelf. You know I love my wife, he said without looking at Isaac. Oh boy, where was this going? Yeah, Isaac said uncomfortably. And when you love your wife, and she asks you to do something that you don't really want to do, you do it anyway. And the thing is, now he turned and looked at Isaac. I also love my sister. So I'm going to do this even though it's making my skin crawl. Isaac still didn't know what was happening, but he strongly considered running away. So, my sister likes you, and I'm supposed to ask you why you don't like her back. Isaac stared at him, speechless. Never in a million years would he have believed that what was happening right now could ever happen. Yep. Just like we're in high school. Liam sighed. Like I said, I really love my wife. So let's get this over with. Do you like my sister? There was no way for Isaac to come out of this in good shape. Either he told the truth and then told Liam that he couldn't act on his feelings because the Bannons were stuck-up rich people, or he lied and said he didn't like Dee Dee, which would offend her brother. Then he thought of a third option. Yeah, of course I like her. But I'm her employee. I've been trying to keep it profess. Good, Liam interrupted. Then you're fired. Now go ask her out. He pointed at the barn door. Then he chuckled. Just kidding. 
but really, we can find another bodyguard if that's the problem. There are lots of men who can keep my sister safe. There might be only one who can make her happy. Liam groaned and looked away. I would so much rather be at the dentist. Okay. Isaac wanted to be out of this conversation as well. Okay. So you're gonna go in there and sweep her off her feet? And the moment kept getting weirder. I. If you're not interested, just say so, man. I'm not trying to strong arm you into marrying my sister. Marrying? Who said anything about marrying? Good grief, these Bannons played for keeps. But she has liked you from the jump, so if you're not interested, maybe you should make that clear so she can move on. From the jump? What on earth did that mean? Yeah, before we even hired you. She hadn't met me when you hired me. She met you when you jumped in to be her knight in shining armor at the restaurant in Rapid. Why do I know more about your love story than you do? Oh. That. Yes, that. And then she saw you in church on Sunday and got all excited, said you were crazy hot. I was uncomfortable then, but nowhere near as uncomfortable as I am now. Isaac's stomach dropped. She said I was crazy hot? His mouth was suddenly too dry to bear. Liam stared at him, and Isaac saw something like anger bubbling behind his eyes. He got nervous. Yeah, Liam said. Crazy hot. You're sure it was those exact words? Yeah. I'm sure. Why are you torturing me? I have to go. He turned and made a beeline for Dee Dee. He had made a horrible mistake, and though he'd worked to forgive her for the offense she had never actually committed, it had continued to color his image of her, and that was so unfair. He burst into the kitchen a little more dramatically than he'd meant to. All six people at the table looked up at him. Ma pointed a wooden spoon toward the living room. He turned and headed that way, but Dee Dee wasn't there either. He found one of the teenagers in the hallway. Have you seen Dee Dee? He didn't look up from his phone. Upstairs, I think. He took them two at a time. Her bedroom door was shut. He knocked on it. Dee Dee? No answer. Oh for crying out loud. She was really going to make him work for it, wasn't she? Brooke came out of the master bedroom, carrying the baby, and Isaac flinched. He always felt a little creepy being in this part of the house, especially all alone. Oh hey, she said, not at all creeped out. Dee Dee said to tell you that she's taking a shower. She said she'd meet you in the living room. Chapter 31 When Dee Dee entered the living room, Isaac jumped up like a jack-in-the-box. Everything okay, she asked nervously. No, he hurried toward her with such urgency that she thought he meant to pick her up and sling her over his shoulder. But he stepped by her instead and shut the door. What was with all these people shutting the living room door all of a sudden? What is it? I need to apologize. Okay. He didn't say anything else. Are you going to tell me what for? Uh... No. Maybe. I don't know. I didn't really think this part through. This part of what? She laughed uncomfortably. Okay, well, I forgive you. Thank you. So I've formed an opinion of you, and I don't think it was accurate. No kidding. And I'm sorry. Okay. I forgive you. And I was way grumpier than you deserved. She laughed. Yeah, I know. I think I was the first one to say that. Isaac, where is all this coming from? You haven't been grumpy in a long time. I know, but I just wanted to apologize for it. He smiled bashfully. Better late than never? She nodded. Sure, I guess. And I was also wondering if you had found a date for the New Year's Eve party that you wanted to go to. Oh, no. She avoided his eyes. I decided not to go to that. It wasn't a big. What? Why? He was strangely invested in this. She shrugged and headed toward the couch, not wanting him to sense her disappointment. I don't know. Just changed my mind, I guess. 
he grabbed her arm and gently spun her toward him. Please. Let me take you. As your date. Your real date. Oh. My. Word. Blade did it. I don't know how, but she did it. Dee Dee was tempted to ask him what Blade had done to him, threat of violence. Bribery? Blackmail, but she didn't want to look a gift horse in the mouth. So she simply smiled. Really? He nodded. Really? But I haven't been on a real date in a very long time, so you'll have to go easy on me. She nodded. I will. She really wanted to kiss him then, but she held back. And then he pulled her the rest of the way into his body, and he kissed her this time. And it was the best kiss of her life. The kiss that trumped all other kisses. She was glad he was holding onto her so tightly because she felt a little dizzy. Like altitude sickness without the mountain. She thought she heard the door open and really hoped she was wrong, but Isaac pulled away. David stood in the doorway staring at them. For a moment, he was frozen there. Then he started to back up, saying, Uh, sorry. Carry on. Keeping his eyes on the floor, he shut the door. Isaac's eyes met hers, and they shared an embarrassed laugh. Well, there, Isaac said. So, now that this is happening, whatever this is, now what? She shook her head, still holding his arm for balance. I'm not sure. Maybe they could just hang out in the living room and kiss all day? Now that the door had been practicing being shut, maybe it could try out being locked. Do you want to go somewhere, maybe? Or not? Just an idea. He glanced at the television. It was obvious that he was tired of watching her watch television. This was convenient, as she was also tired of TV. She gasped. If we're going to the party, want to go shopping for a New Year's Eve party dress? Absolutely not. I mean, I would love to. He cocked an eyebrow. I don't have to wear a tux for this one, do I? Only if you want to. He laughed heartily. Uh. No, thank you. Okay. Let me go get changed, and then I'll meet you by the door. Didn't you just get dressed? He looked down at her jeans. She wanted to look good, to look better than this. Yeah, but these aren't my shopping pants. He chuckled uneasily. Okay, then. Go put on your shopping pants. And my shopping makeup, she thought as she left him behind. She headed up the stairs, and it felt like her feet weren't even touching the steps. She was floating. Chapter 32 Even though Isaac had sort of helped Dee Dee pick out her New Year's Eve party dress, she still took his breath away when she came down the stairs in it. He didn't know if he'd ever seen a more ravishing woman, and he was glad he was alone in the foyer, as he wasn't sure how obvious it was that he was smitten, and he didn't want her brothers seeing him this vulnerable. Wow, he managed. You are a sight to behold. She giggled lightly. You're not so bad yourself, cowboy. He was getting used to her calling him that. It was growing on him. Everything about her was growing on him. He helped her into her coat and then offered her his arm. Shall we? She leaned into him. We shall. New Year's Eve snow fell lightly on her shoulders and dark hair as he walked her to the truck. He gave her a hand into the cab though he knew she didn't need it. She'd been mounting horses since she was a toddler, she could climb into a pickup. Still, he enjoyed helping her, and she didn't seem to mind being helped. He got behind the wheel, plugged the address she gave him into the GPS, and then they were on their way. Music, she asked. Sure. How about some Joe D. Messina Christmas carols? He didn't know if she was kidding, looked at her quickly, and was relieved to see that she was. Nothing against the talented Ms. Messina, but he'd had enough Christmas music for a year, at least. How many people do you expect to be here? That's a great question. The party is also celebrating Lindsay's 10-year wedding anniversary, so she's going all out. I know she rented the whole bar, so I'm guessing that this is an invitation-only thing. He hadn't realized they were going to a bar. He hoped he wasn't overdressed in his sports coat. 
Then he glanced at Dee Dee's dress and realized he was barely keeping up with the only one who mattered. You really do look beautiful. Takes my breath away. Wow, keep up the sweet talk, please. He chuckled. Was this really happening? She had never insulted him. She'd never thought herself too good for him. That had all been in his own head. He thanked God that Liam had set him straight. He could have missed out on the best thing that ever happened to him. The best thing that ever happened to any man ever. She sang along with the radio, lightly, and though she missed some notes, her voice was beautiful. He was happy that she was comfortable enough to sing in front of him. But Dee Dee Bannon was pretty comfortable around anyone, now, wasn't she? They were there too soon. He was reluctant to share her with a crowd of any size. She slid out of the truck before he could help her and looped her arm around his before starting toward the door. Someone opened the door for them, greeted Dee Dee by name, and then they stepped inside. And yep, this was quite a party. There had to be a hundred people crammed into this small one-room bar. People nearly lined up to greet her, and she introduced him to everyone, one person at a time. She did this without ever saying the word bodyguard or employee, and no one acted like it was anything other than perfectly natural that he be there with her. And though he was technically off the clock, he still surveyed the room. An emergency exit in the back. No windows. Two bathrooms. He looked behind him at the door they'd come through and was glad to see a man there acting the part of a bouncer. Good. She should be pretty safe here. Finally everyone who wanted to had greeted her, and she slid her hand into his. Would you like me to get you something to drink? I could use a pop, but I'm happy to wait on you. She smiled brightly, and her eyes twinkled, reflecting the multicolored lights strung around the bar. Let's wait on each other. She gently tugged him toward the bar and asked for two cokes. Nice to see you, the bartender said. I heard you've had some trouble lately. Good to see you out and about. Isaac's hackles went up, and he studied the man. Have we met? Dee Dee sounded suspicious as well. The man shook his head. Just seen you around. I'm a friend of Lindsay's. His hands busy with their drinks, he pointed at their hostess with his forehead. Dee Dee seemed satisfied. Isaac, not so much. What's your name? Isaac asked. Matt, he said easily. Matt Trembler. He didn't recognize the name, but he'd been away for a long time. He paid for their drinks and put his hand on the small of Dee Dee's back as they walked away from the bar. Ever heard that name? No, but that's not necessarily a red flag. West Hope might be small, but that doesn't mean I know every single person in it. But he thought that she did know most of them. Stop being paranoid. She put her drink down on a high table and leaned on it. He'd seen a bit of paranoia in her too, if it could even be called that when it was justified, but he didn't call her out on it. Those snacks look tempting, she said, looking at a long table covered in plates of food. But we've got to stay up till midnight, so I don't want to start eating already. He didn't follow, and his eyes must have shown that, because she added, I'll get sleepy. She leaned closer and whispered, I'm really not much of a night owl. A man walked close by, staggered a little, and grabbed Dee Dee's arm to steady himself. Isaac straightened in alarm. It's okay, Dee Dee said quickly, to him, and then, to the man, might want to slow down a bit, Brian. The night is still young. Brian laughed uproariously and brought his bottle to his lips as he walked away. Nice try, Isaac said. Yeah. Poor Brian's a little too fond of his beer. Always has been. A woman approached, and Dee Dee squealed. Lindsay. She hugged the woman. Congratulations. Thank you. Lindsay looked at Isaac. This must be the bodyguard I've been hearing so much about. It is, but tonight he's just my date. Oh yeah? Does that mean that they caught the guy? So what's it like being married ten years? Dee Dee redirected her. Lindsay shrugged. It's great. Feels like I blinked and a decade went by. Two kids will do that to you. You going to have another? She laughed loudly. Oh no. 
Donnie has cut me off. Isaac's eyes traveled the room, looking for Donnie. A man playing darts in the corner kept glancing over at Lindsay. Either that was Donnie, or she had a stalker of her own. How is business going? Dee Dee asked. Great, Lindsay said. They own a motorcycle shop in town, Dee Dee explained. Oh. He was suddenly more interested. Black Hills Moto? Lindsay nodded. That's the one. Cool. Dee Dee eyed him curiously. Are you thinking about getting a motorcycle? The thoughts crossed my mind. After I get settled. She clicked her tongue. I have so much to learn about you. She said this as if it was a good thing. You know that Dee Dee can ride, right? Lindsay said. Good grief, could she get any hotter? I did not know that. Just barely. Lindsay made me learn a long time ago. I haven't ridden in ages. Wow. Not too long ago, Isaac's life agenda had two things on it, get a job, and get a house. Now the list was growing rapidly, tropical vacation, motorcycle road trip, and make sure Dee Dee Bannon falls completely and hopelessly in love with him. Chapter 33 The party was a bit of a snore, but Dee Dee was having the time of her life. Something had changed. Isaac was looking at her differently now. Either he'd finally decided he liked her, or he'd liked her all along and had finally decided to stop hiding it. She had made him dance to more than half the songs, she'd worn much better shoes this time, and had only let him take this extended break because she wanted a snack. She'd grabbed some stuffed mushrooms while he fetched two more cokes, and now they were taking a breather as the adults around them talked about the sports their kids were playing. You went to school with Lindsay? Isaac asked. Dee Dee nodded. I did. Were you close? She shrugged. We were all close. It's a small school. We were like siblings. He chuckled. Yeah, like you didn't have enough of those already. She laughed too. I forget that you went there too. Weren't you close to your classmates? Not really. I was kind of invisible. She studied him. I find that hard to believe. How could someone that gorgeous ever be invisible? I was. I never spoke in class. I didn't get great grades and didn't flunk. I didn't do any extra school activities. No sports or anything. Trust me, I was invisible. I'm sorry. Don't be. It suited me at the time. I came out and scathed. She smiled. They must have gotten married young if this is their 10-year anniversary. Yep. It didn't seem that way at the time, but yeah, they were pretty young. They were high school sweethearts, though, so I guess, when you know, you know. Why put it off? He surprised her by stepping closer to her, putting his hand on her lower back and giving her the sweetest, tenderest kiss on the forehead. Well said, Miss Bannon. She didn't know what that meant exactly, but she was swooning. She polished off her pop and looked at the dance floor. Then she looked at the clock. She wasn't sure they had time for another dance before midnight, and she didn't want to miss it. Isaac looked at the large screen TV on the wall. Can you imagine being there right now? Where, Times Square? He nodded. She shuddered. No. He laughed. I can picture you there. Right in the middle of that crowd, living it up. Well, sure, I could survive it, but I don't think I'd like it. No? Why not? You love parties. She glanced at the door. Yes, but I want to be able to leave when I'm ready, not be trapped in the middle of a giant mob. He laughed. You ever been to New York City? No, you? He shook his head. Wanna go? What? Right now? He laughed again. No. I just meant someday. To visit. See the sights. It's a pretty major part of America, and well, America is a pretty big deal to me. It would be cool to see more of it. Then, yes. Let's. He raised an eyebrow. Yeah. 
sure. Why not? We're young, healthy, and I don't yet have to spend every waking moment driving my kids to and from sporting events. And like you said, this is America. Yeah. But let's wait till spring. Deal. He sighed wistfully. You want to dance? She glanced at the TV. I don't want to miss the ball drop. I won't let you. I'm sure all your friends here will shout out the countdown. Oh yeah, that's right. I forgot that was a thing. Okay, let's do it. She slid her hand into his and let herself be led out onto the dance floor. Brian hadn't taken Dee Dee's advice and was now so inebriated that he ran right into Isaac, but Isaac didn't act offended. He simply helped him stand up straight and then kept going. When they reached the center of the floor, Isaac took her into his arms and held her even tighter than he had the last time. This is it, she thought. He's the one. All these years wondering when he was going to show up. Never thought he'd come in the form of a bodyguard. Suddenly she was really, really grateful that she'd gone out on that ridiculous excuse of a date with a man named Milton. She leaned into Isaac's shoulder and relaxed. She let the music travel through her and enjoyed every note. She had never been so happy. She was so in tune to the moment that she didn't know why Isaac's body stiffened, or why he spun her toward the wall and started guiding her that way. Then she heard the scuffle near the door and looked up. But she couldn't see anything. The bouncer was yelling, but she couldn't make out what he was saying over the music. Then a woman screamed, and the music cut out. Somebody get him, a man hollered, and Isaac turned completely around to face whatever was happening, holding her behind him with one hand. She didn't protest. She was happy to be behind him for whatever this was. And what was this? Had someone had too much to drink? Had someone tried to start a fight? It wasn't Brian this time because she could see him. He stood less than ten feet away from her, dancing by himself, staring at the big screen. As she stared at him, he hollered, ten. Ten what? Nine, he hollered. Oh. The countdown. But Brian was the only one doing it. She swung her attention back toward the scuffle, and then she saw him. The crowd was parting as Milton stormed toward her, waving a small pistol over his head. She stopped breathing as her heart pounded hard enough to hurt. 8. I told you not to cheat on me. Milton yelled. She cowered behind Isaac. 7. Brian yelled. Milton was closing in, and she was frozen. What was she supposed to do? He had a gun. 6. And why wasn't Isaac doing anything? She didn't know what she wanted him to do, but he was just standing there. 5. And then she realized that Isaac was keeping himself between her and the gun. Maybe he was waiting till Milton got close enough to do something. 4. If that's what Isaac was waiting for, he wouldn't have to wait much longer, because Milton was really close now. And then in one swift, fluid, beautiful motion, Isaac strode toward Milton, raising his left arm above his head. 3. As Milton brought the gun down to aim it, Isaac's left hand found Milton's arm. 2. Milton's eyes widened just before Isaac's right fist connected with his face. 1. Happy New Year. Brian yelled as Milton crumpled to the floor. Then Brian blew into his kazoo, and it was the only noise in the room. Dee Dee's eyes flicked to Isaac's hand to make sure that he now had the gun in his possession, and he did. She was still looking at the gun when he grabbed her around the waist and pressed his lips to hers with a sense of urgency she'd never felt before. She returned the kiss, nearly crying with relief. Isaac pulled back and leaned his forehead on hers. Happy New Year, Dee Dee. You are the most amazing woman on the planet but I have to tell you something. Oh no. She braced herself. What? I officially quit being your bodyguard. And then he pressed his lips to hers again. Chapter 34 I'm so glad to see you again, and so soon. Isaac's mother plopped a plate of cookies in the middle of the table. It had been a week, and Isaac felt a little guilty that she considered that soon. Well, I wanted to tell you something, Isaac said. Oh yeah? 
What's that? Her expression was impassive, but he thought she could guess if he pressed. She wasn't a stupid woman. But he was also happy to tell her. He was happy to tell anyone who would listen. He reached across the tabletop to take Dee Dee's hand into his. Why was he nervous all of a sudden? Did he think Dee Dee was going to yell psych? And then cackle sadistically once he told his mother? He took a breath. I am no longer employed by the Bannon Ranch. His mother eyed their hands and then looked up at him. That makes sense, since they caught the guy. Right. And also, I have asked Dee Dee to be my official girlfriend, so I don't want to work for her. So where are you going to work? His mother, always the pragmatist, was more concerned with that than with his love life. Black Hills motto. She looked horrified. As a salesman? He laughed. No, no. But they need someone behind the scenes. Way, way behind, where there are no customers. It doesn't pay as well as the Bannons, but I think it will be fun. I don't want you riding motorcycles. Let's save that argument for another day. But mom, you're kind of missing the exciting part of this. She smiled and sighed heavily. I'm sorry. I am happy for you both. I guess I just don't want to get my hopes up too much. Arg. Maybe he shouldn't have told her in front of Dee Dee. Please do, Mrs. Bishop. Please do get your hopes up. Because I am crazy about your son, and I am in this for the long haul. His mother studied her, a new spark in her eyes. And do you want to have children? Mom. Isaac cried. This was a disaster. What had he been thinking? He should have invited Veronica too, made it a real train wreck. Yes, of course. I love kids. She squeezed Isaac's hand. But I'm also enjoying this part, so no need to rush. She looked at his mother again. And I look forward to getting to know you better. His mother smiled. Okay, then. She pushed the plate across the table. Have a cookie. Isaac knew Dee Dee didn't want one, but she took one nonetheless. So, you must be so relieved to have that creep in jail where he belongs. Dee Dee nodded. I sure am. It's an answer to prayers. And I guess riding motorcycles isn't as dangerous as you overcoming an armed madman with your bare hands. Her words practically dripped with pride. Isaac smiled. Making his mother proud never grew old. He wasn't exactly a skilled gunman, but yes, I think my combat days are now officially behind me. And I know it's not much comfort now, but the gun wasn't even loaded. Really? What, did he use up his one bullet at that fancy fundraiser? The sheriff doesn't think it was loaded then either. What? Isaac shook his head. I know. It's weird. But when they checked at the bar, his gun was loaded with blanks, and they couldn't find any bullet holes anywhere at the hotel, so they are assuming he used blanks then too. It's dangerous to assume. And we don't need to know. I'm just glad it's over. But why would he do that? She wasn't going to let this go. I don't know, mom. Maybe he shouldn't have told her that part. Maybe he wanted to make sure he didn't accidentally shoot Dee Dee. I suppose that makes some sense. How did he know where you were the other night? Did he follow you to the party? No, Isaac said. Apparently, the bartender was a buddy of his. Not sure how a guy like Milton gets a buddy, but I'm trying not to dwell on the details. He could tell Dee Dee didn't want to talk about this anymore. So, Ma Bannon wants to know when you can come over to the ranch for supper. The invitation surprised her. He'd known that it would. Well, whenever is good for her, I suppose. Good. How about Saturday? I'll clear my calendar. He laughed. His mother was a funny woman. Dee Dee was going to love her. He sat back and admired them both. It felt great to be in a room with his two favorite women. He was going to have to do it more often. Epilogue I can't believe you talked me into this. Isaac stretched out his legs and wiggled his toes in the sand. Dee Dee leaned into him, her wet hair tickling his shoulder. 
As I recall, I didn't have to do much begging. No, I know that, but it was a long flight. I swore I was done with long flights. Nothing is a short flight from South Dakota. He laughed. Ah, uh. Minneapolis isn't bad. She playfully slapped his stomach. Why would we want to go to Minneapolis? Because I've never been. Fine. She adjusted her sunglasses. We'll go then. The sun felt so good on her skin, and it felt so good to be sitting in the hot sand with this man. She probably would have agreed to go anywhere. They have a sculpture garden. That might be cool. Or we could watch the twins play. She giggled. We could do both. Hey, let's go in the water. You were just in the water. I know, but you weren't. She jumped up and then reached down for his hand, and though he made a big show of giving it to her, she knew he didn't mind. Once she had a firm grasp on his hand, she turned and ran toward the water, tried to, anyway, he was like an anchor dragging behind her. But she made it to the water and then let go of him. She lay back and let herself float. Ah, uh. this is so nice. Like a giant, salty bath with gentle massaging waves. Yes, it is. You were right. Me? I wanted to go to Thailand. You're the one who picked Mexico. Right. But it was your idea to force me on a vacation when I've only been at my new job for six weeks. She giggled. Yeah, I had to call in some favors for that one. She didn't know how close to her he was until she felt his strong arms under her, picking her up to a stand. Then he pressed his lips to hers, and she could taste the Pacific salt on them. He pulled away and said, maybe we should come here on our honeymoon. She raised her eyebrows in exaggerated surprise. Honeymoon? Aren't we getting a little ahead of ourselves? He shook his head. Nah. I want to make sure we can agree on a honeymoon destination before I commit to a lifetime with you. She tipped her head back and laughed, keeping her arms around his neck. Well, then, sure. We can come back here for our honeymoon. She kissed him again. But I think that every day with you is going to feel like a honeymoon. I doubt it, but I hope so. She ran her hands down his arms, overwhelmed with all she was feeling. I sure am in love with you, Isaac Bishop. Oh good. Because that was the plan all along. She leaned into him and whispered, you're supposed to say that you love me too. He shook his head. Dee Dee Bannon, promise me something. Maybe. Promise me that you will never, ever doubt how much I love you. She wasn't sure she could swing that, but she was willing to give it a go. I'll try. Okay. Keep trying. Practice makes perfect. Then he pressed his lips to hers again, and she couldn't believe how happy she was.